all of our families and friends by adjourning at 7.30 is my goal. So I would really appreciate really attentive, because we have 23 testifiers on our first bill, so if you could please listen attentively to the people preceding you, so that if they say exactly what you want to say, you could just come up and say, it's already been said, and walk away. We would really appreciate that in the time, but we do want to re be respectful of you coming out on uh, a late night when you could be home um, doing what your normal Thursday night looks like, so I do, we do respect that. So we're going to kind to cut people off at two minutes so if you could no matter what stick to to one to two minutes the testifiers even though you may have prepared a wonderful Gettysburg address type um, presentation we'd appreciate it um, being bre brevity um, and so um, thank you members for being here tonight thank you guests for attending tonight we really appreciate it um, at um, where we're at in the in session um, I just want to remind members that uh, my the, the civics bill. Where is that? No. Um, the civics bill requiring civics to graduate is going to be uh, uh, sent to general orders. Uh, Senate File Six One Eight, and I'm I'm announcing that. Oh, I have to make a motion. Uh, um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes, Senator Abler. And, you know, can, I we, mind. can you just wait? No, I just actually, it's the beginning of the meeting. I just thought it would be a good time to announce what, what's going on like tomorrow and Monday and Wednesday so that everybody who's listening at the beginning of the meeting could know what to plan for. Okay. Yeah, we, I announced this. Um, not, now I sound like the teacher explaining to the kid okay. that was late. Um, we've already gone through that, Senator. Never mind. Um, no, sincerely, um, just FYI, so all members can be reminded. Um, tomorrow, we're planning on being, um, you will get a copy of the, um, the, the final um, policy bill. Monday, we will have the walkthrough of the policy bill, along with two other bills, and then Wednesday is set aside both during the scheduled times. Wednesday is set aside for all amendments and any discussion of the, of the policy bill. All right, and then we discuss when is public testimony going to be allowed on this? Wednesday for the whole two hours. Well, Mr. Chair, what if there's a lot of amendments and a lot of testifiers? Let's see how it works. So te public testimony is Wednesday for that? Because mm -hmm. right? yeah, the last one I talked to you privately, you didn't know. So We could come back that night. But uh, I'm thinking we might be fine. I like being here in the evenings. It's with this kind of, thank you, Mr. Chair. Th thank you, Senator, for your um, always intellectual curiosity. It does not go unappreciated. And hopefully we, two hours, and we may have time on Monday as well. So, okay. All right, so in, um, so if you could make sure you, if you are on the agenda to speak, if we could get you rotating so that your, the next speaker comes up, sign in under the, um, the register, the docket, whatever that sheet of paper is called, and when you're, um, and then we'll just go right through the testifiers and we'll see how quick we can get through this. And um, with that said, are we good? Okay, and could the two members of Pelsby, wherever you are, come up and join Senator Kunish? So, um, thank you. Again, thank, it, thank you everybody for being here tonight. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, sorry to keep you here on a Thursday night, but I would like to make a motion uh, for Senate File 1477. So moved. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Chair and members, this is a bill that um, adjusts tier licensure provisions. It modifies it. Currently, tier two teacher candidates may obtain a tier two license by completing coursework and meeting two or more of the following requirements. They need at least eight upper division or graduate level credits in relevant content area. They need field-specific methods of training, including coursework, at least two years of teaching experience in a similar content area in another state, a passing score on pedagogy and content-specific exams, or completion of a teacher preparation program. This bill would require Tier 2 teacher candidates 
prospectively to complete a teacher preparation program to obtain a Tier 2 license. It also removes the ability of a Tier 3 teacher candidate to obtain a Tier 3 license without at least three years, and that's a minimum, three years of teaching with a Tier 2 license and evidence of evaluations that do not result in placing the teacher on an improvement proce uh, process. The bill seeks to increase qualification thresholds of teachers so that those uh, Tier 2 teacher candidates complete an approved teacher preparation program and provide resources to districts and charter schools to help teacher candidates complete alternate alternative teaching preparation program. The bill appropriates $800,000 over the next biennium to Pelsby to ensure that all district employing tier two uh, t license can support individuals as they move through. So we will be putting staff in place to help these uh, teachers move through an approved alternative preparation program. So that's what this is all about. This is helping tier two teachers move through approved programs or licensure and they can use the portfolio process. It appropriates $50,000 to complete the online platform licensure via portfolio because we have heard time and time again that there just isn't enough staff at Pelsby to help um, this portfolio <coughs> approval and $300,000 to fund a new position at Pelsby to support candidates through those alternative pathway programs, including the licensure via portfolio process. All current Tier 2 license holders on a pathway to Tier 3 license would be able to continue, so we're not eliminating it, we, they would be able to continue through the process of life, licensure but future candidates would be required to be enrolled in a Minnesota teacher preparation program, hold a master's degree in a content area, or have completed a state approved teacher preparation program. And the reason we want to do this is that we want to ensure that our students have well trained, well uh, rounded teachers in the classroom. I've seen over the number of years that I've been a teacher where we get really comfortable in our space or in our classroom and changes happen. So maybe a first grade teacher, that position is going to be eliminated and all, uh, all of a sudden now they have to move to a different position. We want to make sure that the teachers that we have in our schools have had a broad array of um, opportunity to learn a broad array of of pedagogy, of teaching skills, um, building relationships within their, uh, their, their cohorts. There are many different ways that this can happen. And so we are not trying to stifle any of our teachers, our tier one, tier two, and moving into tier three licensure. This is really an effort to make sure that they have the resources available to them and that they are fully prepared to address the needs of all of our children. So with that, I'm not sure what you want to do next. I think we would like to um, just hear about this from, from Pelsby. Is that correct? Correct. And Senator, do you have an amendment, the A1 amendment? I guess I do. It's the A2 A. amendment. And so in front of you, you, uh, you should all have the A2 amendment, and I, I um, offer that for your, accept your approval. Mr. Chair. Sen Senator Abler. Well, just to the whole bill, and I think this is, kind of we did part of this before where there's an extension, but um, just if I'm, if I'm clear about the bill and the amendment, how it's going to make it. So this portfolio business, is that just for the people in the pipeline? And How about then, if you, we wait until we get into the bill? Right now I have to pass my amendment. All right, that's nothing to do with this. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. All, so can we vote on? Oh, okay. So is my, my amendment is approved, is yeah. accepted? We have to vote. All, all those in favor of the author's amendment say aye. 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 Aye.
And then, um, why don't, uh, Senator Abler, I didn't mean to cut you off like that, but um, let's hear the presentation, and then that might help understand it a little oh, bit better. Yeah, that's fine. I, I didn't know if we were just going to move into testimony, but yeah, if there's a presentation, I'm happy to yeah. listen. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for having us. For the record, my name is Dr. Elena Bailey. I am now officially the executive director of Pelsby. Happy to be here and not interim any longer. Um, I'll do a quick walkthrough of this bill and a few points of context that will help as you inform your voting today. Um, first, the first section of this bill modifies eligibility for a tier two license to align with enrollment and teacher preparation, which is a current requirement as well as expertise, so having that master's degree or equivalent. Again, this is already a current requirement. It just moves the other pathways, which are not equivalent, where you have taken a few credits of courses or passed exams, and those folks would now be eligible for a tier one license. So it doesn't change their ability to be in the classroom, it just changes which license they will hold. Section two removes a pathway to a full professional license based on experience alone. And this would ensure that all professionally licensed teachers, meaning teachers who are able to move and be employed in any district across the state and renew indefinitely, that's what we mean by a full professional license, have met state standards through either teacher preparation or the portfolio process. Section three provides funding for districts to support teachers in getting that full licensure by enrolling in prep or completing the portfolio process. That $800,000 uh, that is a part of this for the two fiscal years is enough. Currently we have 1,100 tier two teachers that do not, are not um, having completed prep or enrolled in prep. That $800,000 would be twice as much as that is needed to put each and every one of those tier two teachers through licensure via portfolio. So this would cover every tier two teacher that we have in the classroom that would be affected by this change. Um, if you can move to the next slide. A couple of points to clarify because this bill, as with tier licensure, can come with some misconceptions. The first is, again, that these changes remove teachers from the classroom. You may have seen some handouts floating around that suggest that we're removing teachers from the classroom. Again, to clarify, all this does is moves which tiered license these teachers will have. As many of our stakeholders and testifiers will explain, a tier one teacher is still a licensed teacher. This just changes so that those individuals will now hold a tier one instead of a tier two license. Additionally, because the majority of our teachers right now teach in a shortage area, those individuals can renew indefinitely. Anyone teaching in a shortage area on a tier one license can renew indefinitely. So there's not really a limit on how long they can stay in the classroom. The second misconception that these changes particularly harm teachers of color the vast majority of our 113,000 licensed teachers in the state, including our teachers of color, hold a tier three or a tier four license. So the majority of teachers already hold that full professional license. Pelsby supports, as you'll hear in other bills today, removing barriers and structural issues that keep our qualified teachers of color out of the classroom. That includes things like testing, funding, items like that. We also affirm the capacity of every person of color to meet state standards. We just spent three and a half years working with all the teachers across the state to define those standards, and we affirm that people of color are fully capable of meeting those. The last misconception is that these changes fail to consider district hiring concerns. Again, this bill doesn't change a district's ability to hire a tier one or tier two teacher. In fact, we're proposing funding to better support them so they can not only get those tier one teachers in the classroom, but keep them and move them up the tiers. Next slide. I'm trying to be quick because of time for you all. Um, I've had some of you reach out about data on this. So, so far, to be abundantly clear, we've had tiered licensure in place for five years. We've had thousands and thousands of tier two teachers, and about 100 of those thousands of individuals have used the experience pathway to get a tier three license. 100, and, well, 99 to be precise. Of those, 17 people are people of color. So across five years, 17 people. This is to give you a picture of all of the teachers that we had in our classroom for the last school year, 21-22. The individuals on that tier two to tier three experience class pathway make up 0.2% of our classroom teachers. So you get a sense visually of the impact of this policy. If you can go to the next slide really quickly. This shows you the policy impact particularly on BIPOC teachers. So on the left you'll see of the other policy that Pelsby proposes which is removing testing as a structural barrier, that would impact all of the green. That would move about two or 300 teachers immediately to get their full professional license. That blue slice are the individuals that would be impacted, the 17 individuals impacted by this policy, individuals of color. 
On the right-hand side, this gives you a sense of the bi all of our BIPOC classroom teachers for 21-22, and of those BIPOC teachers, that small blue sliver are the people who came through the tier, through, tier two to tier three experience pathway. So I'm just giving you context so you get a sense of the numbers of the actual individuals impacted. The last thing I'll say is you go to the last slide, and this just gives you the shortage areas so you know. This is just the state shortage. It, the list is longer when you look at regional shortages. But the last thing I'll say is this. While we are talking about 99 people and 17 people of color over five years, I want to be explicit and clear with this committee. You're gonna hear from a number of testifiers that are gonna come and talk about the amazing skills that they bring to classrooms as tier two teachers. You're gonna hear from administrators that talk about the amazing tier two teachers they have. We 100% agree with those teachers. They are qualified and they deserve to be in our classrooms. Our job at Pelsby that you've given to us, delegated by you all, is to take the long view, to use our research and our expertise to think about the profession, to know what it takes not only to get those folks in the classroom, but to keep them there. So we know nationally based on research is that those teachers that we get in that are amazing that you're gonna hear from today, they don't stay if they're not prepared. We also know from our own data in the state, again, that of the thousands of teachers we've had from tier two, only 100 have used this pathway, and the majority of our tier two teachers that have come through over these past several years haven't stayed in the Minnesota teaching classrooms. So what we know and we're proposing is what's actually gonna get and keep our teachers and our teachers of color here. It's not popular to take the long view, but it's important if we really honestly want what's best for our students and best for our teachers. So I'll leave it at that. Senator, we'll just rock through the testifiers. Mr. Good. Chair. Oh. Thanks. And I usually I have this position of um, because we do have so many testifiers, I say let's wait till we've gone through them all. So let's okay, so add, uh, back no, no but let's not yeah. do that tonight because I don't want you to have to go back to testifier number one after 22 has gone. So it just makes sense yeah. to to, well, to not really do sure. my usual policy. Well, so, anyways, when I, I, I go was, ahead, Senator Abler. Yeah, and um, actually, I thanks uh, Dr. Um, uh, Bailey. I appreciate your views, I don't agree with them. Um, I, uh, I just think we're on the wrong track here, totally. Uh, there's 3,273 tier two teachers, 804 are BIPOC. I think if we paid attention to those individuals in the way we're going to pay attention to the ones who are gonna move through now, more will draw in. There aren't enough human beings in Minnesota to take care of all the jobs. And you have 804, and so the question is, why aren't they staying? And why aren't teachers saying, why aren't they coming back? But these will actually want to be here. And so um, there's a letter here. I wish I would have written it from this crew here with all these groups, the Advancing Equity Coalition, the African American Leadership Forum, et cetera. I agree with this group. And I think if you really care about helping get more teachers come in, <clears throat> tier two is like the way to go. So I'm done, Mr. Chair. I'll be back and forth. I have to solve all the health problems next door. But thank you for your Those are as thank important. You. Thank you for your indulgence. Yeah. You're welcome, Senator Abler. Go, go ahead. No. OK. OK, I think you're done here. I, I was going to move for test yeah. fires. So Mr. Peltier and, Mogul, and Ms. Mogelson. You're up next. Hi, can you hear me okay? Oh. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Swidzinski and members of the Senate Education Policy Committee. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Peltier, and I'm a band and choir teacher in Faustin, Minnesota. I am also a board member on the Professional Educator Licensing and Standards Board. My classroom is 265 miles from your hearing room today. And I urge you today to pass Senate File 1477 and ensure that we have qualified educators in Minnesota schools. It's hard to recruit and retain educators in greater Minnesota, and it gets harder when they're not trained with the skills that they need to make it in the classroom for the long haul. Many are being left to fail, and Senate File 1477 allows us to fix that. I'm a Minnesotan, a ranger, and I started out on teaching in North Dakota through a non-traditional path. There, I had to rise to the occasion to show evidence of teacher preparation in order to continue to teach. This training and mentoring allowed me to gain the missing skills I needed to be effective in the classroom. I urge Minnesota to catch up to North Dakota and do the same. I have seen unprepared teachers who are good with kids but short on skills. 
They're not getting the help and training they need to effectively serve students in the classroom. And the state's pedagogical standards, the standards of effective practice, are just that, standards. They're there for a reason, because they're tied to student outcomes. I have seen some special education colleagues struggle. They struggle with paperwork and knowing how to teach. What ends up happening is that veteran staff have to pick up the workload. This, in turn, increases staffing stress and leads to more burnout. If they don't last, a new person is hired and veteran staff have to begin what feels like a never-ending cycle of retraining another new person. Now to expect administrators to fill in the prep gap is unrealistic and unfair, especially when many of them are not trained in teacher preparation. Some of them have to even take on extra duties like subbing on bus routes. How much more can we expect from them? And finally, as a member of the Professional Educator Licensing and Standards Board, and currently one of only two active public school classroom teachers serving today, I am keenly aware of what happens when unprepared colleagues join my school staff team. The challenge is significant in Greater Minnesota, where I teach, but guess what? Teaching is a professional job. It's about time we trust teachers to say what we need. Let us lead on teacher things. And what we have said is that we need colleagues who are trained to do the job. Please pass Senate File 1477. Thank you very much for the time. And just go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Laura Mogelson, and I'm here from the Minnesota Association of Colleges of Teacher Education. So Pelsby has articulated minimum standards that teachers must meet to earn their full teaching license. There are alternative programs, there are higher education programs, there's the portfolio process. We all organize our curriculum or modules or the portfolio platform, whatever it is, around these standards. And these are standards that are um, based on the content that a teacher is going to teach and on the general how to teach, the pedagogy standards. The tier two to tier three experience pathway bypasses these standards. So why should we even have them? With our current system, a teacher can move to the permanent license if they haven't been placed on an improvement plan, and not being placed on an improvement plan is a very low bar. There are also statutory requirements that are required in teacher prep programs, alternative or higher ed or via the portfolios. These are requirements such as um, teaching reading, meeting the needs of English learners. For elementary and special education, we now have uh, special statutory requirements around teaching students with dyslexia. These are met via programs that I just described. Going from a tier two to tier three without prep actually bypasses all of these requirements and it's very concerning. We're also concerned about the special education uh, rules under IDEA specifically around um, preparation uh, for special education teachers, which this um, is a violation of. So many argue that this pathway must remain so that um, there's access. As has been illustrated, there is access, there are options, and we are very supportive of this bill and want to collaborate further to create the options for people to be successful in the field. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, my name is Dr. Sarah Ford with Education Minnesota, and I'm here to provide some context for the language in Senate File 1477. There are two ways to confront a teacher shortage. One way to address a shortage is to look at and address the reason teachers are leaving. A full third of new teachers don't stay in the profession beyond the first few years in Minnesota. Teachers of color are leaving the profession at higher rates than white teachers. We could address those known and knowable issues and build the profession up. The other approach, the one Minnesota has adopted for the past decade and functions more as a way to break down the profession, is to focus only on removing requirements around who districts can hire. This approach ignores the needs of students and our inexcusable opportunity <clears throat> gaps, and it puts the teacher attrition rate into overdrive, making the long-term problem worse. Teachers who do not have content and pedagogical training leave the profession at two to three times the rate of teachers who have that training. In Minnesota, the students most likely to be taught 
by teachers teaching without any preparation at all are our students of color and our special education students. They are also the most likely to face a revolving door of educators, losing out on the ability to develop the long-term relationships upon which so much development and learning relies. I want to be clear, this is not the fault of educators in any of the tiers. We need everybody. Students need them, including, above all, equitable numbers of teachers of color and indigenous teachers, and they need those teachers to have access to and all of the benefits that come with and resources that come with high retention teacher preparation. Proposals that support teacher candidates through high retention teacher preparation and provide all students with fully prepared teachers, they matter a great deal. Please support this bill. Thank you. Chair Switzinski, members of the committee, good evening. My name is Matt Shaver, and I'm a teacher with a Tier 4 license, and I'm the policy director at Ed Allies. I'm here to testify in opposition to Senate File 1477 as amended. Thank you to Senator Kunish and committee members for listening to our feedback tonight. This bill would eliminate pathways to renewable licenses by re uh, removing the three years of teaching experience pathway, as well as eliminate six of nine ways a person can qualify for a Tier 2 license. With the amendment, some of the harm of these changes will be pushed out a few years, but would have a negative impact on an in immeasurable number of potential future teachers starting next year. The current tiered licensure structure is helping to diversify the teacher workforce and address shortages. The data show that in a state where 6% of teachers are teachers of color, 25% of tier two license holders are teachers of color. This info is on page 20 of Pelsby's 2023 supply and demand report. According to Pelsby's 21-22 assignment data, dozens, and in some of your cases, hundreds of tier two teachers are in school districts teaching right now that you represent. Why would we close the qualification door behind them? If this bill passes a few months from now, someone with the exact same qualifications as many of the tier two teachers in your communities would not qualify for a tier two license. A couple of statements being made on the implications of this bill keep missing the second half of their sentences. Proponents of this bill say, only 99 teachers have used the experience pathway in five years. They neglect to mention that for the first three years of tiered licensure, no, two no tier two teacher was eligible to use that path because you had to teach three years first. So to be clear, 99 educators have used this pathway so far in two years. If you look at the data on page 16 of 2023, the supply and demand report, up to 1,000 more teachers will use this experience pathway in the next three years. This bill closes the door behind them. Proponents also say only 17 teachers of color have used the experience pathway, but that's 17 teachers of color so far. In a state where 6% of teachers identify as people of color, 17% of teachers using any specific pathway who are BIPOC is plenty of reason to protect it. Again, in the next few years, a couple of hundred teachers of color could use this experience pathway. Proponents say a tier two teacher can just do the portfolio, but neglect to mention what a massive hassle for working teachers the portfolio process has historically been. Removing a pathway that works to force people to use one that doesn't isn't effective policy. Proponents of this bill say that a person can simply get a tier one license if they don't want to complete a portfolio or enroll in teacher prep. They neglect to mention that tier one licenses have the least job security, ensure statutorily that you are hired last, and must be renewed annually with Pell's beginning a $57 fee each time a tier one teacher would have to renew instead of the every two years for tier two, every three years for tier three, and every five years for tier four. Moving teachers down the tiers shouldn't be anyone's goal. Finally, proponents of this bill mention that tier one and tier two, two teachers struggle in the classroom and leave. This conflates tier one and tier two teachers with new teachers. Why do new teachers struggle and leave? Perhaps it isn't what path they took to the classroom, but the teaching conditions they have once they are in them. I wanna thank you all for your time tonight and public service to our state. Mr. Chair. I do have some questions for the testifier, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, proceed. Uh, thank you. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Chair. Uh, Mr. Shaver, um, I'm curious if you happen to have any numbers or statistics handy that have to do with uh, people of color and the percentage of them at the respective tier levels of licensure. Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, um, yep, and so. So be, before you, Mr. Chair, if I may, before I ask you that question, I want to preface it with this. Um, earlier, it was shared with us that this bill 
will somehow lead to or encourage more people of color to be in the profession of teaching or make it easier for them to get a license. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping you'll share with us what percentage of folks of color exist at these different tier levels and whether or not you actually think this legislation is going to encourage and draw more, more folks of color into the profession or if it's going to be a hindrance. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, so um, looking at the 2023 Pelsby Supply and Demand Report, I'm here on page 19. Looking uh, by tier, total BIPOC teachers on tier one, I'm seeing 4.76%, 5% of all teachers of color hold a tier one license, according to Pelsby. 12% uh, of all teachers of color hold a tier two license. 20% of all teachers of color hold a tier three license. And 63% of all tier four teachers hold a 64% of all teachers of color hold a tier four license. Now on the next page, um, we can take a look at the percentage of tier holders who are people of color, teachers of color. So the percentage of tier one teachers who are teachers of color is 28%. The percentage of tier two teachers who are teachers of color is 25%. The percent of tier three teachers who are teachers of color is 9%. And the percentage of tier four teachers who are teachers of color is 5%. And they hold all together about 6% of licenses in the state. The second half of your question, um, Senator Duckworth, I would not recommend closing pathways uh, into the classroom or to make teaching a uh, permanent option for folks. Senator May Quaid. Um, Senator May Quaid has to go back a couple of testifiers. She came up with something interesting to ask. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was in my head abiding by your old policy. I forgot about the new policy. And so um, I, I can't tell if this is for Dr. Sarah Ford. I, I think it's for, or Laura Mogelson. It's for one of you. I'm so sorry that I don't know which one of you it's for. And I apologize. <clears throat> I think it's, yeah, I think, Laura, you'll be the right person. So okay. I was in the House when we passed the tiered licensure into law, and I remember asking at the time, so I have a degree in political science and justice and peace studies. Um, with that bachelor's degree, I could have become a tier one licensed teacher. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Mr. Chair. Mr. Mr. Chair. Yeah. yeah. Senator. Um, so then if I taught in the classroom for three years and was not put on an improvement plan, and I was a tier, and I became a tier two licensed teacher. Moving up, after three years of a tier two with my bachelor's degree, currently I could become a tier three licensed teacher. Is that accurate, um, Chair Senator? Uh, so you would have had to have met one of the current um, qualifiers for being a tier two teacher. So um, there are right now eight or nine quali uh, qualifications for being a tier two teacher and then not be on an improvement plan and then have taught for three years and then after that third year and that fourth year. So this is starting at a tier two then, not the tier one example you gave, but um, then and in that fourth year going to the tier three, correct? Okay, Mr. Chair, thank you. So I didn't go to become a teacher. So what would I have missed then? What I think what I'm missing is wanting to understand, like, what do you learn in teacher preparation programs to teach in schools that you might not learn getting a political science degree or getting a justice and peace studies degree or getting an English degree, you know, all of those things. What do I miss? Chair, Senator. So in your ex pretend example here, let's say you are a, um, with a political science degree, you are a social studies teacher in a, in a high school. That might seem like the fit for you. Um, so you do have the content background, absolutely. But it's all of the other pieces of teaching that you don't get just through necessarily osmosis of being a classroom teacher in a, in a school that, would pr that you get through alternative preparation, traditional teacher preparation. It's all of these um, standards of effective practice that we call them, the general pedagogical standards. And they're organized around things like child development, um, diversity or equity, um, teacher professionalism. It, there are, um, we just adopted in our state and will be enacting in, in teacher preparation 
all of these standards of effective practice that you have to show evidence of having met that help prepare you to become a teacher. And um, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, um, Mr. Chair, if I, my uh, colleague from Education Minnesota could also. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, for the record, Caitlin Snyder with Education Minnesota. I apologize, Dr. Ford had a family obligation. Um, but um, to build on Dr. Mogelson's point, some of these standards are, are critical aspects of a teacher's position. We're talking about the mandatory reporting requirements. We're talking about the teacher code of ethics. These are pieces that are built into the standards of effective practice. Now, these can be demonstrated through a licensure via portfolio. They can be demonstrated through an alternative or a traditional teacher prep program. But these are vital to the success of a teacher meeting the needs of a student. I will also add, um, you might have heard about the standards of effective practice in the last few months because their recent revision included things like saying you need to affirm a child's identity, including their gender identity. And that might be a detraction for some folks in the room, but that is something that I strongly believe that our teachers need as they're entering the field. It also talks about teaching, um, understanding how systemic racism can affect our kids. And these are things that I would go to the mat for in saying that our teachers need to have to be successful in the classroom. Mr. Chair. Thank you, that, this is super helpful. I think, and if you could just maybe get like one level below, like standards of practice, what would that look like? Let's say I'm a, I have an English major, they've put me in the second grade classroom. What would I, have, what would I not know about literacy, reading, child development at that age that I would know going through a teacher preparation program? If anything. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, Senator. Um, thank you for the question. So the way that um, these, these standards are, um, as, I, as I shared, organized in these categories, right? And you're, you're learning things like planning, um, uh, lesson design, management, things like mandated reporting, as, as uh, my colleague pointed out. Um, you are also learning the methods of teaching. So in your, your question right now around an elementary classroom, for example, you're learning the, the teaching methods, the content and pedagogy, and the methods of how to teach reading, how to teach elementary mathematics, how to teach all of that elementary content. Um, the signs of dyslexia, which is, as I shared in my previous testimony, we're now statutorily required to teach elementary um, teachers how to recognize the signs of dyslexia. Um, all of this um, interest right now in the science of reading and phonics and phonemic awareness and fluency and vocabulary and comprehension, this is all taught in preparation. Or if you are going through the licensure via portfolio process, perhaps you've gone through um, the professional development training your district offers and it's a very intensive hundreds of hours in, in teaching reading. You know, that can all be um, utilized in the portfolio process to show that you've met all of these standards for teaching the content and the general standards for teaching children at the ages of kindergarten through 12th grade. Thank you. Mr. Chair, and I appreciate you giving me the time with that. I think one of the things I just that was important to me is that I think we often mistake teachers as like nice, smart people who are in rooms with kids instead of like a really, really serious profession that mm -hmm. has standards and practices and science and all of these things behind it and that teaching is both a science and an art and that in teacher preparation you're getting a lot of that science. And so I, you know, I would never want me to teach anybody's kid without someone telling me how to teach kids. And I, I, and I wanted to hear this because I was, I, I feel like I was missing that context. Mr. Chair. Briefly, I don't want to, I don't want to. Senator Duckworth. Thank you. I don't want to sidetrack us. I know we've got a lot of folks that are here to testify, but um, that made me think of something and I have a question for uh, one of the representatives up there. First and foremost, so I want to make sure that we're all remembering the conversation we're having regarding standards right now. Uh, because I don't look at these bills individually or in silos. We're going to have others here before us later today that could arguably say uh, diminish or reduce standards to get licensed. So I think it's a worthy conversation. Uh, if we have a teacher shortage, we need to be very mindful about pathways and the ease of which folks can get into the profession. My question has to do uh, is for um, uh, Caitlin. I apologize for using your first name. But um, I, I'm just curious, is Education Minnesota as a teacher's union aware of and supportive of the repealer in this bill that eliminates a lot of the ways in which someone would be able to get a tier two license and stay in the classroom? 
Mr. Chair, yes. Follow up, Mr. Chair. And so Education Minnesota is supportive of limiting these ways in which people can get a tier two license and be a teacher in the classroom. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, we are supportive of the bill and in making sure that the people that we bring into the classrooms will stay in the classrooms. Um, there are reasons why people leave the, the classroom. A lot of it is about the working conditions and when people are not prepared fully to be in the classroom, it's, it's not an easy job. And people sort of start blaming themselves for not being able to meet their students' needs and that's what leads people to leave the profession. We want people to stay in the profession. We have, I believe it's 60,000 licensed teachers that are not working in the classroom. And you know, some of those folks are around the table, but some of those folks are you know, selling computers or working at Target. Um, jobs that they feel that they have a better working condition and that they have better preparation to meet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to, uh, briefly, I would agree that teaching is an extremely difficult and taxing profession at times, which is probably why we have a shortage, which is why we need to make it as easy as possible for people to get their licenses, renew licenses, move up a level in their license if need be, uh, especially if we're also trying to encourage teachers of color who happen to be uh, largely at the one and two tier licensure level. So if that's the goal, I think we need to be very uh, mindful of the limitations that this bill would impose in its repealer in terms of being able to get a tier two license and stay in that classroom. So I, I appreciate the testimony and you're gonna hear me keep harping on this because if the consistent message is we've got a teacher shortage and we want teachers uh, of all backgrounds in the classroom to help our students and we want pathways, then we have to have a consistent set of bills and legislation here that's gonna allow us to achieve that. Thank you. Next presenters, thank you. Next presenters, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Kimberly Lewis, and I'm here today on behalf of Minnesota school boards and superintendents across the state. In 2017, an effort to address the state's teacher shortage and modernize licensure was brought forth and overhauled. The new law consolidated licensure authority under one board, created a new four-tier licensure system, and conformed existing statutes. It's provided our districts with what they need most, additional pathways to bring teachers into our classrooms. In just a few short years, we've seen an increase of teachers of color and CTE teachers, largely due to the additional pathways brought forth by the tiered licensure system, and we want to see those increases grow as the system continues to work. The licensure system broke down barriers for qualified candidates, and it included recommendations from the OLA report citing deficiencies and concerns. It was implemented with a great deal of teamwork and fidelity. At least 35 amendments were offered through the legislative process to our memory. It was vetted in public by the public. We truly believe our superintendents and administration have the knowledge and skills to ensure that they have the best candidate in our classrooms. We have faith in these officials and we trust our school boards. With significant teacher shortage that has only increased over the last five to 10 years, the tiered licensure system has opened pathways to teaching. MSBA started uh, the Teacher Shortage Act one and two. This has been a concern of our members for many, many, many years. There's no evidence that the tiered licensure system isn't working. The bill before us seeks to modify tier two and tier three licensure requirements. It would eliminate six of the nine pathways to tier two licensure and eventually remove the pathway from tier two to tier three for teachers with three years of successful experience. In respect to Senate File 1477, we are opposed to removing pathways to licensure at a time when our districts are still facing significant teacher and substitute shortages. According to Pelsby's recent report, the vast majority of school districts have difficulty in hiring both teachers and substitutes. Quote, a majority of districts reported being somewhat significantly or very significantly impacted by teacher shortage, 84%, and substitute teacher shortage, 89%, end quote. Our organizations would like to continue to work with the authors of the bill so the pathways can remain open and barriers can be eliminated to increasing the number of teachers and substitutes for our districts. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next presenters. Or do we not know who they are? Uh, Ms. Spencer and 
Mr. Perez. And then the next two are um, Lincoln Bacall and Kulia Pringle. Um, Mr. Chair, you missed Sebastian Hansen and Eric Hansen. Uh, they're not able to make it. Oh. Um, thanks for catching that, though. Thank you, Chair Swazinski and members. My name is Julian Spencer. I'm 19. I'm a policy fellow for Youth Prize, which works to increase equity with and for Minnesota's indigenous, low income, and racially diverse youth. Seven years ago, I was a sixth grader who had just been expelled from school and entered the juvenile justice system. Thanks in part to Marcus Walker, a black teacher who taught the black culture class at North High, located in North Minneapolis, I'm here with you today. If it wasn't for Mr. Walker, I would have dropped out. As a black man growing up, there were not a lot of teachers that looked like me. That was especially disappointing as a student in schools with mostly students of color. When I met Mr. Walker, I was disengaged with school, but he did his best to reel me back in. The mentorship that I got from him changed my life and the lives of my classmates who are dealing with, with similar circumstances. Without his mentorship in the school building, I don't know where I would be right now. I always had this feeling that he understood me in ways others couldn't. I've never had that experience in all my school years. Like many excellent teachers of color, Marcus Walker teaches on a tier one teaching license. That means he has to reapply every year and each time the district must show it cannot find a tier two, three, or four teacher. If 1477 passes, it would mean that the only way Mr. Walker can stay in teaching is if he goes back to school to complete an expensive, time-consuming teacher preparation program. Please don't put another barrier in front of teachers like Mr. Walker and many others like him, including future teachers of color. Please don't incentivize the already unacceptable shortage of good teachers of color. Two weeks ago, I had signed up to testify on this bill in the House Education Policy Committee. I was not allowed to voice my concerns because I was supposedly not directly affected. I disagree. This proposal will not only block pathways to the, to the Mr. Walkers, but also hurt young black and brown students like me whose lives will be changed by tier one and two teachers who have a non-traditional pathway to teaching. The, legislator sh the legislature should be celebrating and supporting life-changing teachers like Mr. Walker and other teachers, not raising barriers that that might force them out of teaching. Thank you guys so much. Tell Mr. Walker what you said tonight, please. I will. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Swedzinski and the members of the Education Policy Committee. My name is Jose Perez. I am a first generation high school graduate. I'm the partner of policy for Bridgemakers, a youth led statewide organization supporting education innovation. I testified at this very committee two years ago um, against a very similar bill. I'm here today because of many of us believe that this bill would devastate the education of many young people by blocking essential pathways to the classroom for a countless innovative teachers of color. School has always been a struggle for me, especially as a kid who is a dyslexic English language learner and who started off their education career flunk in the first and the ninth grade. Born into poverty, a broken home, and a single mother working overtime just to make ends meet for her two children, we relied on our public school. We relied on the amazing teachers in that school. For many of us, it's a rare but inspiring occasion getting the opportunity to experience a teacher of color. And I've actually had that experience myself. One of my most inspiring teachers, who is actually here today, Ms. Haben geber gertkisch my math teacher. Haben, can you please stand up for the Senate? Thank you so much. Haben has stood by me every year of my high school, and I'm here today to stand with Ms. Haben. 1477. Oh, and I just want to name that Ms. Hobbins is a tier two licensed teacher. 1477 proposes to eliminate all non-traditional pathways to long-term teaching, every single last one of them. 
which will make it harder for future outstanding tier one and tier two teachers to stay in the teaching profession. Since black and Latino teachers are six and, since black and Latino teachers are eight and six times more likely than white teachers, since black and Latino teachers are eight times and six times more likely than white teachers who have tier one and tier two license, this means new barriers will likely reduce the number of teachers of color in Minnesota who are already severely underrepresented. That would be a disaster for students who are, that would be a disaster for students with stories similar to mine for whom teachers of color are often crucial in student re-engagement, personal connection, and helping all students of all students reach their full potential. Why would Minnesota, why was us as Minnesotans who are dealing with large racial opportunity gaps and a teacher shortage make ch changes that would likely reduce and not increase the amount of teachers of color supporting our struggling students? Why would we make it harder for our young people to learn and thrive with people that give them hope and remind them that they can do this as well? Please allow the teachers who uplifted me and so many other young, amazing people to continue their life-changing work because they're already so underappreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the members of this committee. My, thank you, um, members of the committee, uh, Mr. Chair. My name is Kulia Pringle, and I'm the Minnesota State Director for the National Parents Union. I'm here to express my concerns around the components of Senate File 1477. This bill would eliminate teacher pathway options that many people who want teachers to, be, to uh, teachers to get into the classroom. I'm particularly concerned about the impact this will have on teachers of color and will utilize tier two licensure and, and aspiring teachers who may want to utilize this pathway. This bill will eliminate six of the nine pathways tier two licensure. The elimination of this teacher licensure pathway would create unnecessary barriers for so many who are trying to overcome or become a teacher. Um, as you stated, um, Chair uh, Kadesh, I wanna echo everything everybody else said that was a part of my testimony. So I'm gonna end with, I know um, firsthand because I did go through a traditional teacher prep program before I um, landed in this position. I know the many barriers that um, teachers face when going through a tradi traditional teacher prep program, which keeps many from even entering. If the current teacher prep program is tied to student outcomes, then, th then, what, is, then what is going on with um, outcomes of black, indigenous, low income, and students with disabilities? If the status quo was the way to go, then why are so many children who look like me are getting left behind? From my experience, teachers of color are not leaving because of the teacher prep program or lack of. Many say it is the microaggressions they face from their white counterparts. My advisor at Metro State, Dr. Spees, who is here today, can testify he had to come out of his own pocket many times just to help me get over the barriers while I was going through a traditional teacher prep program. And he also ensured out of the, the things that I was willing to share, he tried to make sure that he could do whatever he could departmentally to make sure that I would succeed in my teacher prep program. I will leave you, this, would leave you with this ask. Please work with community to solve the teacher shortage and do not create unnecessary burdens for those who want to be working with our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Swazinski and members of the committee. I'm here to testify against Senate File 1477. My name is Lincoln Bacall, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Bridgemakers Minnesota, a youth-led nonprofit that advocates to ensure no decision is made that impacts young people without young people at the table. I want to bring us all back to the purpose of education, the success and well-being of the next generation. I'm here testifying on behalf of students whose futures are dependent on the work this committee does. When I was in high school just a few years ago, I had several teachers who changed the course of my life and propelled me to become the nonprofit leader I am today. Two of the most impactful teachers I had were tier two teachers who were educated and had become fully qualified in other states, but coming back into Minnesota had to become tier two and go through the whole process again. I am particularly opposed to the proposition that would close the pathway to a tier three licensure for tier two teachers who have taught for over three years. The supporters of this bill will argue that since no current teachers are being taken out of the classroom, this bill is harmless. But the students across Minnesota that I represent with my testimony are the future teachers who will have more barriers to pursue teaching as a career. 
Ultimately, Senate File 1477 only creates more barriers to having exceptional teachers in the classroom who represent the, teacher, or represent the students they serve. Chair Swazinski, I met you several years ago when I was a page in the high school page program, and I remembered feeling secure afterwards knowing that there was someone in the Senate fighting in the interest of young people in Minnesota. I hope to see your continued commitment to involving youth voice and needs in your work. I implore you all to consider the real stakeholders, students, when you vote on this bill. Look around the room and look at the testifiers who are young people who are speaking against this bill. All of us are here because we know this will hurt our generation. Please vote again, Senate File 1477. Thank you. I yield my time. Good evening. My name is Paula Luxemburg, and I'm the parent of three kids who attend public schools on the north side of Minneapolis. Here in Minneapolis Public Schools, 184 of our teachers have tier two licenses and half of them are teachers of color or indigenous. So tier two licensure is working as a way to ensure that we get more educators who look like our kids. I'd like to share a statement with you from one of those educators, a black woman named Trina Lyon. I am a school counselor over at Lucy Craft Laney. I have my master's degree in counseling and psychological services. I have always been passionate about building up our next generation. Prior to joining my school family at Laney, I was a social worker in Hennepin County. Along my journey, I have also worked with high school students on developing effective leadership skills, children who were removed from their homes due to safety concerns. I've provided school-based mental health at the elementary level in St. Paul provided counseling to survivors of sexual assault, and provided counseling to students in the juvenile detention center in downtown Minneapolis. My educational and professional background mean I bring a unique skill set to the work I do here at Laney. I am not just another face or name to my students and colleagues. I am Mrs. Lyon, someone they can confide in. Our children need more people who look like them in positions of leadership, modeling what success looks like. My tier two licensure does not say that I am ill-equipped for the work that I do. However, it does say that I have a skill set that sets me apart and it allows me to approach school counseling through a different lens. I'd like to thank you for your time tonight and I implore you to focus on ways to support a variety of qualified folks like Mrs. Lyon to become thriving educators without cutting off pathways that are already working. Please don't make changes that would limit the ability of future educators to obtain tier two licenses or to move from tier two to tier three after proving successful on the job. Thank you. Reeve Ridgeway and Haven. Thank you. Reeve Ridgeway and yes. ha Haven. Oh, we're on hybrid? Okay. Good evening, members of the committee. My name is Reeve Ridgeway. I'm a Minneapolis public school parent, and I'm here to share my concerns on Senate filing 1477. Minnesota has some of the lowest teacher diversity and is among the weakest with outcomes for students of color. I'm not an education leader, I'm just a parent, and the correlation couldn't be more evident. The students of Minnesota, every single one of them, needs teachers of color, because having a teacher of color shows our students who can hold knowledge, lead, and have authority. Senate filing 1477 will have unintended consequences, reducing pathways many teachers of color have followed. Currently, 25% of tier two teachers are teachers of color, and reducing the tier two pathway will disproportionately impact future teachers of color. Further, we have an unhealthy number of vacancies across our state and over 150 vacancies in Minneapolis public schools alone. I urge you to reconsider this bill and invest in more pathways to become a licensed teacher in our state. Thank you. Is it my turn? 
Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Havan Gebra Gergish, and I've been a practicing Tier 2 licensed math educator in St. Paul for four years. I attended public schools in St. Paul, and it's an honor to give back today. I'm a first generation college student who graduated with honors from the University of Chicago. And after college, I taught high school math for four years in Detroit, Michigan, and received my provisional teaching license through the University of Michigan. And on the path to licensure, um, there were a lot of things that I had to do, including evening. Um, uh, classes as well as monthly Saturday uh, professional development sessions for two years. I submitted a portfolio that included my vision and mission as an educator, and I also received monthly observations and reports from coaches who were committed to my success. When I moved back to Minnesota, the Tier 2 licensure option allowed me to remain in the classroom while I worked on my master's degree. Uh, I now have a master's degree in education from Hamlin University, and I'm well on my way to moving up to a tier, uh, to a tier three license through the state exams and my four plus years of teaching experience. As a, I'm also a teacher leader who facilitates professional training opportunities and consults with administration on a variety of issues related to effective instruction. And I've also presented at numerous conferences all over the country to help teachers develop project-based learning curricula. Um, the main thing that I want to say today that I think hasn't been said is that even through all of the education that I've gotten going through the University of Chicago, going to get my master's, um, since I've started teaching, when I started in uh, Michigan, I would say compared to that and what I'm doing now, um, most of what I was using then in terms of lessons, instructional strategies, and relationship building strategies, I don't use now. So what I want to emphasize, since this is really a conversation about teacher preparation, um, part of being a good teacher is constantly shifting what you do, constantly changing. The things that I was uh, told was good instruction, good practices, is not the things that I believe are good now. Um, and so uh, part of the reason that I'm speaking here today is the reason I'm not using the things in the past, thinking about what hap what's happened in the last two years, these kids have gone through different things that have shifted what it means to be a good teacher, what education means. We're living in a world where now students can, you can present a problem and AI can tell you the answer. We're living in a world where students can use AI to uh, figure out what, to write papers for them. We're in a completely different world. We're living in a world now where the CDC had, has reported that there's higher levels of, than ever before of uh, mental health issues and psychological distress, particularly in our girls. These students that are here now are not the students we had 10 years ago. So I'm not trying to diminish what professional development is and these training programs because I do value the training that I got. But to me, being a tier four teacher is not just the uh, education that you got. It's also the willingness to always transition and constantly learn. So what we need to do and, um, and spend our resources on is constantly training teachers at whatever their level, level they're, they're at. Because me, as a teacher that's taught for 10 years, I'm working with teachers with 20, 25, of experience, 25 years of experience that are getting professional development from me because the things that they have been practicing do not work anymore. Let's make sure we're using our energy on the right things. Thank you. Uh, Alicia and Jamie. And then Justin and Chris. Thank you. Alicia, Jamie, Justin, Kristen. Hello, my name is Alicia Monserrate and I am currently a tier two social studies facilitator at Exploration High School. I began my career in education through a rather non-traditional route. I worked as a paraprofessional until COVID hit where I then began working in public relations. While serving in that role, I had the opportunity to work on the Increased Teachers of Color and American Indian Teachers Act, where my role was in youth engagement, garnering support for the bill. Through my time organizing and working with young people, actively working to change and disrupt the very systems that create and perpetuate harm, I felt inspired to leave the world of PR and head into the classroom. I started my teaching career as a special education teacher on a Tier 1 license. After I moved to teach social studies, I enrolled in a Minnesota education master's program and moved up the tiers to become a tier two teacher. My story, however, isn't unique. Many people, especially, the educator, especially educators of color, follow non-traditional pathways to enter the classroom. 
While I understand my pathway under tier two is currently secure through this bill as amended, I recognize the immense amount of privilege that I have that has allowed me to pursue this particular path, which certainly isn't the case for many. I enrolled in my master's program, which is costing some $30,000 in three and a half years of my time to be secure in my job, which I'm already doing well. My privileges, including the supports of my community, allow me the opportunity to spend my time and money to become a teacher. I work at an incredible school where I have the support of my colleagues and students who should be receiving more, not less, of my time. My students see me, a first-generation college graduate, queer Latina educator. They rarely get to see people like me as teachers and leaders in their lives. And for many people with similar backgrounds, they might not have the supportive partner, colleagues, money, or family that I have that make teaching a viable profession. This is especially true for people of color who will be disproportionately impacted by this law. Black educators are eight, time more, eight times more likely to be on a tier two, and Hispanic teachers like myself, six times more likely. Why would we want to remove pathways into tier two teaching, demote these teachers' licenses, and limit the ways in which people of color can do the important work of teaching? While I find value in my coursework, the real magic happens on the job. Coaching, mentoring, and high-quality professional development supports are what teachers like me need to be elevated in this profession. Eliminating licensure pathways, especially the Tier 2 to Tier 3 pathway, tells current and future educators who use these non-traditional paths that those experiences in the classroom aren't valued. That because they don't have a master's degree or finished an expansive preparation program, they aren't capable of doing this work. This bill, should it pass, prevents the classroom from being enriched by various real world and lived experiences from educators that can do this work, who are currently proving they can do this work and do it well, might I add. We tier two license holders may not currently be at risk, but we are firsthand examples of why having these pathways is crucial and why I believe it is so important to keep them open for those who wish to follow. Passing this bill will prevent so many capable people from entering an already dwindling field, and I cannot find a plausible reason in which that makes sense. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Jamie Peterson. I am a tier two teacher at STEP at Anoka Hennepin School District. And my license is a career in technical education or CTE license as a teacher of hospitality careers. I stepped into the classroom with 17 years of intellectual knowledge in hospitality and food service experience. Daily, I bring with me my lifetime of training young adults through their career pathways in hospitality and food service and I have been teaching in the school district for six years. As you know, eliminating the option to move from tier two to tier three is part of this bill, so I won't discuss that. And it is important to note, as you already know, that tier one and tier two teachers will then no longer, are not eligible for tenure, being fired every year. As a probationary tier teacher, I have been formally observed by my administrator 18 times. I participate in professional development yearly and after many years as a probationary teacher, my district can assure you that I have met the standards of effective practice for teaching. Pelsby suggests that the portfolio is easy for CTE teachers. The concern is always about pedagogy. However, I ask you to consider who is more important to determine my effectiveness as a teacher, the students and administrators who observe me or the state board who will never actually see me teach. To tackle inclusion, we must be inclusive of those in our community's skill set that demonstrate and encompass skill in manufacturing, cosmetology, construction careers, nursing, hospitality, transportation, and agriculture. All of these daily economic needs start in the CTE classroom, which requires industry background and expertise and the availability of a tier two to tier three pathway. And for these reasons, I am asking you not to support the changes proposed in eliminating years of successful teaching, moving from tier two to tier three t CTE teachers. As innovative education is moving towards student-centered learning that is demonstrated by achievement, I hope our licensing system would also be student-centered and driven by student success. Thank you for your time and consideration. So who's up? Thank you. The list of testifiers is in the back. If you are testifying, please find out when you're testifying so we can keep the pace going here. So I have a Justin and a Kristen next. Maybe they're not here. What? Oh, Kristen, go ahead. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. 
My name is Kristen Damer, and I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Business and Administrative Services for the Moorhead Area Public Schools. I led my district through the changes of tiered licensure, and I'm speaking today in opposition to the proposed changes. The Tier 2 pathway recognizes successful teaching experience in the classroom and provides qualified teachers that have the content, knowledge, and experience in subjects such as science, math, special education, and career and technical education. In my experience, concerns presented as misconceptions are indeed factual outcomes of additional licensure barriers. They this will remove teachers from the classroom as Tier 1 and Tier 2 have no protections for continuing contract, which is not sustainable for long-term employment. With required posting requirements, the district is required to lay off Tier 1 and Tier 2 teachers and hire a teacher with teacher preparation coursework regardless of experience or effectiveness. This could harm teachers of color as any removal of an alternative pathway to licensure can harm historically marginalized communities. The pathway is not meant to be a place to hold individuals to a lesser standard, but the elimination of a barrier similar to removing a barrier of testing as in Senate file 1473. As previously mentioned, in two years of eligibility, 17% of those using the pathway were teachers of color, whereas 6% of our total teachers statewide are teachers of color. In Moorhead, 38% of our tier one and tier two teachers who have not had teacher preparation are teachers of color. This also fails to consider district hiring concerns as applicants eligible for the pathway can often only be approved due to a lack of candidates with teacher preparation or extensive reasoning on why those candidates are not qualified. The messaging has been clear to districts. Ineffective applicants with teacher preparation could hinder the hire and licensing of effective tier one and tier two applicants. Additionally, there is a misconception that there are significant deficits in classroom management without teacher preparation coursework. In review of one approved Minnesota preparation program, there's not a single class focusing on classroom management. However, districts provide support, tools, and professional development all to all teachers, regardless of tier, and recognize the support needs and improvements across all tiers and experience of our teachers. In addition, professional development is provided on the standards previously mentioned to all teachers. Some are required annually. In closing, Eliminating this pathway will make an already significant teacher shortage more urgent and will leave districts without teachers. Teaching teachers who bring knowledge and experience that benefit not only our communities, but most of all, our students. Thank you so much for your time today. So, Sonia, are you next or no Sonia? Hi. Oh. Yep, I'm here. Okay, um, fire away. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Sonia Emmerich. I'm a school board director in the city of Minneapolis and a lifelong Minneapolis resident. I'm also one of just a handful of autistic elected officials in the United States. I certainly didn't take a typical or traditional path to get here, but I consider myself to be an asset to my role. On this first day of Disability Awareness Month, I urge you to remember or consider for the first time that disabled people have always innovated, adapted, and modified typical ways of doing things in order to increase accessibility. We also know that access withheld at the systems level is hardest to work around. Adapting a system is not like acquiring a piece of durable medical equipment or building a ramp. Adapting a system requires changing long-held biases and attitudes about how we locate value in people and their contributions and designing new pathways and practices that purposefully include those expanded concepts of human value and support all people's development and life trajectories in meaningful ways. Our tiered licensure system for teachers in Minnesota was successful in this heavy lift by expanding professional pathways, acknowledging more ways for teachers to showcase their development and skill. As a school board director working in a large and diverse district, I cannot overstate our need for educators and especially of the perspectives and presence of teachers of color, disabled teachers, and teachers from low socioeconomic backgrounds. Allow educators with invaluable lived experience subject matter expertise that matches our students and their families to identify their own most accessible path to their next licensure tier from a variety of options. Our kids can't afford to lose a single future opportunity with such an educator. I have a seven-year-old child who is a student in my district. He has complex neurodevelopmental disabilities that require a homebound educational placement at this time. And because of teacher vacancies, he's been without a teacher since November 2021. 
regardless of the promise and legislation that he will have access to a free, appropriate public education, he doesn't get school. I wasn't supposed to win an election. Disabled people don't get to serve in public office. We also don't get to work in education. And the reason I know that is because I never had an openly disabled teacher in my life. Experientially, I know that the truth is that too many professions do not acknowledge the importance of varied access points. It's assumed that a person who needs or benefits from a less traditional or newly innovated pathway is an inferior candidate or should not be considered a professional, that our value to our fields and communities is questionable. This is not a lesson I want my child to be taught. My hope for him, of course, is that we can secure a teacher for him and that he gets his education. But my dream for him is to have what I never did, disabled educators to show him what is possible for people like him. Please keep all pathways that increase our access to diverse educators open for my district's sake and for my child's. Thank you, committee. Hello, I'm really nervous. Um, taking a breath. My name is Willie Adams, and uh, I am a 25-year veteran teacher from California. Uh, I moved here in June to work at the High School for Recording Arts in St. Paul uh, after Sir, like everybody. you're not on the list of testifiers. I think I was uh, put on for someone who wasn't here. That was my understanding. Who was that? Uh, I believe his name was Matt. Was it Matt? Justin. Is it okay for me to it, speak? So? Yes, um, but tr try to be succinct. I'll be very thank succinct. You very, thank you. In my, t in my experience, two things. One, you cannot teach a child that you don't love and that relationships precede learning. And our students here deserve teachers not only that look like them, but teachers that can understand and relate to them beyond just the academics. Um, and I'm going to ask you to please consider keeping pathways open so that teachers like me can work with uh, those students. Um, black male teachers make up less than 1% of the very small percentage of teachers of color. So I think it's very important that we provide as many pathways as we can for teachers um, of color to stay in the classroom and do the important work. Um, there is really no evidence that a teacher preparation certification program is going to make you a better teacher. Um, th but there is data that shows that being able to relate and connect with students in a real meaningful way can inspire them to greatness. So please, please, I implore you, keep the pathways open. I just, after 25 years, received my tier one license. I had to take alternative pathways to, to teach because teaching is not just what I do is who I am. And I'm going to teach and make sure that students have access to high quality education regardless. But please keep the pathways open so that we can do this the right way. Thank you for your time and I apologize for not formally being on the list. Good evening, Mr. Chair Sawinski, Senator, members of the committee and guests. My name is Nafisa Muhammad and I am a high school English teacher taking a time out. After eight years of teaching and going on strike, I decided to take a mental health break. I now get to support teachers as Deputy Director of Campaigns at Educators for Excellence, supporting those who are still fighting to stay in the classroom. I am here to testify in opposition to ending the Tier 2 and Tier 3 license pathway for experienced teachers who entered the profession through doors that have been previously closed to them. I went the traditional university route of obtaining my teacher license and master's in education. I already had a psychology degree with the emphasis in adolescent development. I think it's ironic that the Patrick Henry class of 2021 voted me most inspirational teacher. Within my commencement keynote speech, I outlined the trials and tribulations of becoming their teacher. Plot twist, it wasn't testing, it was a learning environment and experiences. Moral of the story, I did it anyway. My question is though, is why does it have to be that way? Why must we always endure challenging learning environments that disrespect our lived experiences and cultural identities in order to become 
anything. So in the spirit of transformative justice, let me elevate so that you can investigate the negative actions and cognitions such as prejudice, discrimination, and racism within these institutions, like me being the only person of color in my teacher prep program. I often found my classes to be a place of hostility and isolation whenever the realities of racism and cultural competencies were discussed. I never read a pedagogical or curriculum text written by a black scholar. I had one one black professor who got sick and was replaced by a white elementary school teacher. I was very unprepared. I struggled. Seeking out my own professional development and radical self-reflection saved me. Oh, and no one empowered me at the university level to better understand the politics and the paychecks tied to my teacher license. Thank God for E for E. That's what we're here for. Ending the pathway pigeonholes people like me to one kind of learning experiences, the pathway that privileges Eurocentric ways of learning and teaching. When deciding how to vote on the bill, please consider the following. Do you wish to support increasing teacher diversity and reducing the teacher shortage, or do you wish to protect the wealth of institutions that benefit from all teacher candidates being forced to attend traditional preparation programs regardless of their professional experiences or personal situations? Mr. Chair and members of committee, thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, um, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Senator Yorville. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify. My name is Paula Cole, and I'm the Executive Director for Educators for Excellence Minnesota. I'm also board chair of my local school board. I am a former teacher of seven years who had what you will now call a tier one, a tier two, and a three tier and a tier four license at my time. And I am here in opposition of one particular piece of Senate file 1477. I don't think the whole bill is I don't think the whole bill is a problem, but I do think that the pieces that are challenging these pathways from a tier two to tier three uh, teaching, those are the ones that don't don't live there. I have a little bit of a chronology here, like we you who those of you who were here at the time or at the house or, or the community members who participated, you all decided that you were going to fix the broken teacher licensure system and you implemented teacher licensure. The first uh, day of the Pelsby Board, that was January of 2018, and that was only barely five years. And we have been fighting against this one particular pathway ever since. It's exhausting. I know that you are tired of hearing it. Every year we come here. I have so many teachers. We have 2,300 members. Uh, we have five different things that we work on. Uh, a lot of things that we support, that you did, that you listened to us, that some of you also have. And we don't need to be here again, please. Uh, every time I hear someone say that the t-shirts, the tier twos can renew forever, who in this shortage is going to be put through that humiliation for life every two years to go to Pelsby and get a new license? That's, that's humiliating. And let me tell you, we don't need those, I mean, we need those teachers. They don't need us. And we need to start treating people who want to go be in the profession with more respect. And again, it's just not all bad. There's, like, I know there's a portfolio. I wish a portfolio could work better. Can we like stop this thing here, change it, table it, and then work together in coalition to make maybe portfolio better and more accessible and with a few, you know, fewer hoops. Uh, I'm very supportive of the funding that you're putting in here for supporting scholarship. I'm, we're very supportive of funding to uh, uh, add a personal Pelsby to support people with portfolio. Those are great ideas. And, and honestly, uh, when I hear we only license 99 teachers, let me tell you as a school board member, that is not a small number. Finding 17 teachers of color is not a small feat. It's quite a challenge. And we need every single one of them that we can get. So I live with love. I, I feel for you sitting, listening to people. I'm very grateful that you all are doing that because I know it's, it's, you know, it takes time from, from you and from your family. So thank you for all that you do. And, uh, and, and you know, if we do come back to the drawing table for this, we'll be happy to support. So thank you so much. And our last two testifiers are online, so, and let's try to be, wrap this up, and maybe we'll get through, um, no, we will get through our last three bills tonight, so. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Stephen Montgomery. I'm an educator in North Minneapolis at Olson Middle School. Um, I'm standing in opposition of the Senate Bill 1477 proposed here tonight. At the school I work at, the student demographics, it currently has 63% black students, 12% white, 10% Hispanic, 7% Asian, and 6% who make up two or more races, and 2% indigenous American Indian. That's a 90% rate of student of color along with a 25% special ed designation. The staff at Olson right now comprises of 57 licensed and non-licensed staff members. Out of the 57 staff members, there are only nine staff members who are people of color. Imagine the excitement as a student coming into a classroom when they finally see a teacher who looks like them, who can identify with their struggles, identify with their vernacular, and sometimes they see somebody that they can confide in. Pushing this bill through would strip so many deserving kids of this opportunity. As a product of the current tier licensing system, who has since completed a teacher prep program and has a master's degree in education, I, kind of, I find it kind of insulting to assume that the only quote-unquote prepared teachers are teachers who complete teacher preparation programs. Our kids also need empathy in the classroom, life experience, mentorship, constant evaluation, and high-quality preparation for life opportunities and the things that they may face. For the last seven years in this profession, I've heard the word echo, equity. And we must understand that equity doesn't look the same for every student, but equity is the duty to make sure that every student has equitable resources to be successful. And that's what we must give our teachers. We claim we want to recruit and retain educators of color, but want to reduce the pathways that five out of the nine students at my site currently have used to be teachers. Of my colleagues that have used and tried to solve these issues, I think we'd be more obliged to honor and lift their voices of our current tier one and tier two teachers who have elected to serve our children by allocating more resources and finances to identify and find more effective recruitment strategies to bring more teachers of color into this field. The teacher deficit is not a tier one problem. It's not a tier two problem. It's the system issue. If we want to change the system, we can't continue to deny opportunities to the communities that have been mistreated and historically shunned away from educational institutions. To close, I want to acknowledge and lift up one of my colleagues who was here tonight, a brother who grew up in Minneapolis public schools, where many times he was one of the few black students in the classroom. And that was over 30 years ago. And he has had less black teachers than fingers on his hands. Joey Lash, who has served his community his whole life, most of it as a retired Minneapolis police sergeant, who then decided to even make more impactful change by dedicating the last nine years of his life teaching and leading kids that looked like him and were like him growing up. As many of you may be wondering, Joey Lash is a product of the current chair licensing system. Mr. Lash, you are more than enough to be in our classrooms and teach our children. Thanks, Chair, for your time. And lastly, is she on? Or? Okay. Hello, my name is Mina Leon. I'm a second year special education teacher and E4E member, working in the Minneapolis Public School District as a teacher and case manager in a classroom for students with developmental disabilities and autism at Henry High School in North Minneapolis. I'm currently teaching under a K-12 tier two license with a functional description as an academic and behavior strategist. I'm one of many teachers of color working under a tier one or tier two license district wide who have and are currently experiencing barriers within the tiered system approach that Pelsby has in place. I did take a traditional path towards education, but due to copious amount to the copious amount of barriers that we face as educators of color, I had to seek alternative pathways to seek my licensure, which I am currently still attempting to obtain. With current pathways in place, I am on track to moving up to a higher level licensure. If these pathways are removed, the end result could and will be catastrophic. And it's our young people, it's always our young people, that are most impacted by the choices that adults in power make on behalf of them. Right now, I think about the many students of color in the building that I work with who so deeply rely on the educators of color here to feel seen, prioritized, heard, and understood. They deserve to see themselves in the classroom. They deserve quality education that centers their needs holistically. Liberation for our students of color is providing them with teachers who can lead them there. Liberation for our teachers in larger communities is providing and maintaining accessible pathways that are already in place. By paper, I'm considered unqualified, but I know this isn't true. I believe that my work here in my classroom is good. 
I believe that my work here is thoughtful, intentional, and centers the students that I serve. I believe that I'm prepared to teach our young people that the skills that they need to survive and thrive within a system that is structured to oppress them. How dare the system try to make us think and feel otherwise? Member, members, I plead for you all to reconsider this bill and the changes proposed for the sake of our youth and for the sake of our future. The young people that we are raising deserve to feel empowered. Thank you. Thank you, testifiers. Members? Anything? Senator Duckworth? Senator Duckworth? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. And I'll be brief. I know we've got a lot to do still. Um, I just want to say, you know, as I reflect on the testifiers we had here today, I think we had a, a, the first few were from Pelsby. We had another one from an Association of Colleges of Teacher Education, and then another one from the Teachers Union. And then after that, we had parents, teachers, students, and those that represent school boards. And if you listen to those folks, I think the decision regarding this bill is pretty easy. And taking their feedback to heart is something I hope that we do before this moves forward for any additional consideration. Earlier it was talked about how it's the, the job of Pelsby to look, about the, look at this long term. And I can appreciate that. But in the short term, we've got a very significant issue when it comes to the shortages in our classrooms, when it comes to our teachers. And that has to be solved today. This bill will not do that. It will have the opposite effect. Uh, I don't care what your tier is if you're in the classroom making a difference. Kids don't care what your tier is. Parents don't care what your tier is. What they care about are ways to make sure great teachers can be in and stay in the classroom. We literally have people here tonight begging to stay in the classroom. We've got students begging for quality teachers to stay in the classroom in the midst of a teacher shortage. This bill will not help that cause. It will further exacerbate it. Thank you. Senator, final words? Mr. Senator Coleman, I'm sorry. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I was a little slow getting your attention there. It is late. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. You know, I'm just, I'm absorbing all of this and I'm, I, I'm concerned. We hear that there's a need for more teachers of color. We hear that there's a need for more teachers, period. And we just heard from students and parents and teachers and members of the BIPOC community that this bill is gonna have a devastating impact on those goals. But it seems the only person or groups that we're listening to is Education Minnesota and Pelsby, that we're not listening to the people in this room right now. And so I urge consideration of changes to this bill, but I can't support it in this form, and I hope that my members don't either. Thank you. Senator Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple uh, questions about the process. Um, I think probably for Pelsby. Um, I heard a testifier say that there is no evidence that teacher prep will make you a better teacher. Is that, is there any evidence to that statement? Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Mann, thank you for bringing that up. I actually happy to speak to that point. Um, as a researcher, I can say that's actually not true. I, I appreciate the spirit of what that was said in, but part of our job here and the unpopular part is, again, I agree 100% with the testifiers in the qualities and the fact that these teachers deserve to be in the classroom, but it's my job as a researcher, as an executive director, to take the bigger picture, and I've done the research, um, that there is ample evidence to say that teacher preparation or meeting through alternative means like portfolio, other experience ways that you can do it through portfolio and things like that, do provide um, greater effectiveness and retention for these teachers. So I do, I am glad to speak to that point. Mr. Chair. Um, on a, along those same lines, what, what goes into a portfolio process? Yeah. Thank you um, for that, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator, members of the committee. Um, so I will address, historically, the portfolio process has not been as accessible as it, as it needs to be. So over the past year and a half, we've actually revamped it, and I think members of the public maybe aren't aware of that. So a couple of things. You have to meet your specific content standards that are in rule, as well as pedagogical standards. We've made changes that streamline this. So if you have, for example, course credits, a degree, let's say, in ethnic studies, 
you can just meet those content standards by showing that degree. You have a professional certificate in CTE, meet that, that will meet the content standards. So all that's left are the remaining few pedagogical standards. We've created, uh, worked with a partner to create an online platform, so you can upload videos of yourself teaching, you can take those lesson plans and upload them, and that meets the standards. So it's not that you have to go through and create the same thing as teacher prep, you're literally submitting your lesson plans, videos of the work you're doing. Pelsby also is not the one reviewing those. We ask the teacher's peers do the review, experts in your area. So they are actually witnessing you teaching or your materials, and then they are just saying, yes, this peer meets the standards of our profession. So I think historically it hasn't been, and I think that's part of the misinformation. But again, it is much easier to meet this, and you can literally upload videos and sample lesson plans and things like that to show through experience that these great educators deserve to get this license, and we want them to get that tier three and stay permanently in those positions. So sure, a couple more questions. Okay. Um, and how, how many teachers of color have completed portfolios in, I don't know, pick, pick the amount of years? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Committee, I don't have that number of hand, but I can get that to you. I don't have, I have a lot of data in my head, but not, but not all of it. Okay. Uh, and then last question, Mr. Chair, and this question is actually for the very beloved math teacher. I did not catch her name. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and my question was, did you say that you have a master's in education? Yeah, that's correct. I do have a master's in education, but that, that is insufficient un, um, under the current system even to get me to tier three. There's other things I'd have to do to qualify. A master's in education is insufficient to get you to a tier three. That's true. My next step, I would have to pass those uh, state exams. I did pass the math exams in Michigan, but those don't transfer over. I have to take the uh, Minnesota math exams under the current system. Thank you. May I speak to that, Mr. Chair, real quickly. Um, please reach out to me, I'll give you my email. We actually looked up your file. Yeah. But through your out-of-state experience, you could immediately get your tier three license, or if you have that recommendation letter from TFA. We've changed our board policy now to mm -hmm. accept those out-of-state testing exams, and our other bill proposes removing them all together because people like you shouldn't have to take those exams. You should have already gotten your full professional license. Awesome, thank you, I did not so know that. So I believe that people <laughs> like you deserve to be here. I just am trying to find a ways to help people navigate these structures. Also, the person who mentioned Mr. Walker, Please let me get your email after so I can help that person mm -hmm. get that for full professional license because all mm -hmm. those teachers, I want them to have it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 Let me give you my license. Yes. Have them all email me. Right. I'm telling you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. I, real quick, if I could, I think, um, you know, as someone that, you know, got, I went to the University of Chicago. I've, I've navigated very difficult texts, and I still had really a lot of trouble with this system moving to the state, even just not understanding that. And then also, when I did try to apply to figure out how to get through like the state testing, it was incredibly difficult to even figure out how to register for those like Minnesota state exams. And again, I consider myself an intelligent person. We need to streamline things so that it is easier to understand where you sit and how to get to the next level. That needs to be part of the changes that we make in the system. Thank you. Senator Kunish, any Closing remarks. Um, I really do want to thank every single person that came in this afternoon or this evening to um, share their story. And I actually wish I could turn around and face you. Uh, what you don't know about me is I am um, an indigenous woman. I was a teacher for 25 years. I taught in a, a school where my last, the elementary school where the last year of my tenure there, I was the only. I was like the only white looking person in that classroom. Uh, my other 20 years were spent in very diverse communities uh, and, and teaching. So I hear you, I understand you, and we want all of you in the classrooms. We want every single one of you, if you are dedicated to joining uh, the educational force that we have, we want you. That's why I car have carried the increased teachers, of bill, uh, increased teachers of color and indigenous every single year that I have been in the state legislature. This is my seventh year, and we're gonna pass it this year. That bill re has funding and support systems to recruit, to retain, to help you during your student teaching, to provide mentorship, 
and to ensure that you stay in our schools because yes, I do want to see every single one of you in front of the classroom because I know what a difference it makes when you have, when the kids in our school see somebody that looks like them, that has your life experiences, that can empathize with those children. And our non-BIPOC kids also need to see you in there, 100%. And so we are working very, very hard, just as, um, as um, the director of Pelsby is telling you, to make these things that have not been working, work. But what we are asking of you is to join us in the pathway to licensure, to ensure that all of our teachers have the opportunities Towards, um, towards education, towards mentorship, towards cohort, and we are making it very diverse for you. We are putting dollars into um, the ability for school districts to create Grow Your Own and to have um, mentorship within building cohorts within your, uh, your, your school districts. We are doing all kinds of different things, and maybe you don't see it right here, right now, tonight, but my promise to you is that we are doing that. And we are asking you to join us in this pathway, in this pathway to licensure, because not only is it good for our kids and for your, your teammates, but it's also good for you to have the opportunity to expand your own learning, your own connections, and this is not in any way to punish anybody. It is not in any way to thwart your opportunity to become an educator in Minnesota. So that's what we're doing here. And as I said, it might not be evident to you, but I've got five, six pages of bills here that include things like increased teachers of color, like black men teach in the Twin Cities, like the Santa Foundation, like the Parent-Child Program, like Department of Youth Family Establishment. Um, there's just tons and tons of things that we are working towards. And while it, maybe it hasn't been uh, a, a welcoming or easy for you to do it in the past, we are going to do everything we possibly can to ensure that you have a good experience, that you get the kind of, um, of uh, professional life and the rest of the school does as well. And so I, I hear you. I applaud every single one of you. Every one of you is the kind of person that I want to teach next to but we also need you to help us make sure that we have really excellent teach, uh, teachers in our school, and we're going to help you get to that point. Mr. Chair. Senator. I'd like to, uh, I would ask for a motion to lay this over, uh, Chairman. Mr. Chair, I still was gonna comment. Okay. Are we done? And Are we we're, done gonna move, we're gonna lay it over. Thank you. So. Question or comment? Well, yeah, I, we just had the most inspirational. I've never seen this kind of presentation, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know uh, where all these folks came from, but this is truly impressive. I've, I've been here 24 years. I've never seen this kind of demonstration from the community. Uh, eloquent, uh, clear, focused. I've never seen a letter with that many people writing uh, of people who were trying to accomplish the very same things we say we're trying to do. And Mr. Chair, I was just, I'm not gonna question you at all, just a little bit, I thought, I was moved by this. If I thought this was a good bill coming in, I would not think it's a good bill going out. I would, I would think this bill needs to stop. And I would think that thinking would evolve. This is the legislature, this is the people's government. This is where we debate, this is where people listen, this is where people change their minds. When they listen, I change my mind when I listen to people. And I hope that the supporters of this bill have changed their mind. I hope that the Pelletry Board and Dr. Bailey and I think you're amazing. Um, but I think we shouldn't just hunker down and do the hard thing and ignore 
something that's working. And to cut off a pathway that might draw some of these very young people into the system that aren't so good at the regular classwork. We do things creatively, we do things alternatively to draw people in. Why are they not coming in? Teachers of color, oh, we want more. No, make it harder for those who are here and close the pathway for the future ones that might want to do this. Really? And so I raised this point to you privately, Mr. Chair, and I raised the point in the previous hearing when we talked about it. Um, this tier two thing, I'm new to this topic, refreshing my memory on tier two and one and four and three. Those aren't even sequential. Um, <laughs> but we're on to something. There's 850 teachers of color sitting in, in tier three right now. We're gonna solve that, that's great. We'll get them through the process, but no more. We're closing the door. And so Mr. Chair, please, this doesn't have to go forward. It doesn't have to be in the bill we're taking up uh, next on, on tomorrow when it comes out. This should not go forward. And I was just surprised that people weren't changing their minds. But I, if I was concerned, I am like overwhelmingly amazed at the power of the people who have come out, who have spoken, and I pray that we as a legislature, as members, listen to them. So thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Thank you, Senator Abler. Sorry, Unu Verbaten, Senator, sorry, again, um, you're up. Senate File 1777. Senator, whenever you're ready, let's try to um, get through these last three bills as efficiently as possible, but without stifling debate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will uh, try to be brief, and uh, we've got folks here um, from the agency to help answer questions. Um, in Minnesota, nearly a third of teachers leave the profession within their first five years of teaching. Residencies put student learning at the center of the preparation experience with this intense clinical work and intentional alignment among the residency, school district, and institutions of higher education. The coherence results in a substantive return on investment, which manifests in three distinct ways, having more effective new Senator, teachers. can you stop, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, We're um, having a hard time hearing the speaker, so if you So could, all of you that are leaving, sure. I would invite you to maybe stay and listen to this next bill on teacher residency that is putting dollars in tuition, teacher candidate at living wage. These are the kind of investments we're making. Can you begin again? I'm sorry. Yes, I was having Mr. a hard Chair. time hearing. All right, Mr. Chair. So um, I started by saying that in Minnesota, nearly one third of teachers leave the profession within their first five years of teaching. Residencies put student learning at the center of the preparation experience and with the intense clinical work and intentional alignment among the residency, school district, and institution of higher education. This coherence results in a sub substantial return on investment, which manifests in three distinct ways. One, more effective new teachers. Two, a more diverse pipeline into the teaching profession. And three, higher teacher retention rates. Student teaching can be a huge financial burden and barrier to completing a teacher preparation program and obtaining a tier three license. So this bill seeks to address that. Um, it creates a pilot that would support 400 teacher candidates in a year-long student teaching experience, residency. Um, it complements the governor's proposal to provide student teaching stipends for all students, uh, all student teachers, and that's uh, 5,000 per student teacher. And then it, there's some supports for teacher candidates like mentorship from um, co-teachers, um, the um, financial support from you know, stipends and district paid benefits 
free or low cost tuition during residency, and then supports for districts that include stipends for mentor teachers and statewide support for grantees. Um, but I uh, will uh, let us move to the agency and additional testifiers to provide more information. Mr. Chair, committee members, my name is Michelle Hirschvat and I work with Pelsby. Um, before you is a bill that just has two different sections. One that outlines how the money would be distributed. Um, so it would go to the preparation program, but that money would go then directly to the teacher candidate and mentor teacher. Um, and section two just has that appropriation language. Um, again, I just wanna reiterate this would be for 400 teacher candidates. Um, the amendment that's also before you clarifies um, the ability to work with the Office um, of Higher Education, but again, the money would go through Pelsby, um, but allows Pelsby to contract with OHI, which we are able to do for some of our other grant programs. Jim Grathwell. Mr. Chair, members, Jim Grathwell, St. Paul Public Schools. Um, I want to thank the author for bringing this bill forward. This bill funds innovation that works. So much of this debate, and I'm going to be very brief, we want to increase the number of teachers in color, of colors in the profession. Uh, the St. Paul Schools, uh, Teacher residency program does that. 60% of the cohort are teachers of color. We've, this is an eight year innovation. We've had eight cohorts. We've had 200 students um, come into the profession. They're retained at a greater rate. They um, uh, are more diverse and they're, we wanna increase the number of special ed teachers. 58% of them are special ed teachers. So what do you want? You want to retain teachers, you want to diversify the workforce, you want to increase the number of special ed teachers, and, the, um, and we want to keep students through the program. These programs do all of that. So again, we're investing in success. We really appreciate your support of the bill, the authorship, and the debate we had here tonight. Thanks very much. Senator, do you have an amendment? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, the A1 amendment. Tell us about it. <laughs> um, I'm going to defer over to our, um, to our agency to provide more information again. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, again, my name is Michelle Hirschvat, and the amendment um, clarifies that the grant funds flow through Pelsby, but we are able to work with the Office of Higher Education um, in a similar way that we do with our other grant funding. So it's really meant to be a number of technical changes to clarify um, the grant distribution process and which agency is involved in that process. Thank you. Um, so all those in favor of the office, Thank you, Senator Duckworth, for knowing what's going on. Um, so, uh, all those in favor of the author's amendment say aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you again, Senator Duckworth. Who's next? We already heard. Kathleen Campbell. Oh, thank you. Mr. M Ms. Matt, yep. Cheers, Swidzinski, members of the committee. Good evening again. My name is Matt Shaver. I'm a teacher and policy director at, at Allies. I'm here to testify in support of Senate File 1777 as amended. I want to thank Senator Umu Verbaten for her leadership and vision in working to establish this needed pilot program. I want to highlight a few thoughtful elements of the bill, particularly thoughtful elements of the bill. First, the tuition support, uh, and most importantly, stipend on lines 1.13 through 1.15 will pay people for the work of becoming a teacher. I wish that was an unremarkable concept and just a given, and maybe that will be the case someday. 
Um, the stipend for mentor teachers on lines 1.16 through 1.17 demonstrates the recognition that being an effective teacher mentor requires a distinct set of skills and capacities on top of a teacher's core responsibility to their students. Mentor teachers really make up the backbone of a school. They are teacher leaders and supporters of the next generation of educators. And in addition to being paid, they deserve to be developed, which is why we support ongoing training in PD for cooperating teachers. Broadly, we're supportive of prioritizing educators of color for this pilot. and believe this pilot will fit well alongside the menu of initiatives working to diversify the teacher workforce. Uh, just one quick piece of feedback on the bill. Um, <clears throat> Uh, line line 3.5 notes eligibility for candidates seeking an initial licensure. We think one way to support tier one and tier two teachers to move up the tiers would be to expand eligibility for the residency program to allow teachers who already have experience teaching in schools to access this uh, high support path toward a tier three license. Thank you again to Senator Umu Verbaten for your leadership on Senate file uh, 1777. Thank you again, Chair Swadzinski, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you all for public service to the state. Members, any questions? Comments? Senator May Quaid. Um, I'll just be brief. I have like 30 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Senator Uma Verbaten, this is such an important piece of attracting and retaining teachers. I did not know that they did not get paid for their student teaching until I had a friend who went through college and went into student teaching and was also serving at the same time while pregnant. Um, so this is just, this is such a good bill. And I'm really excited that you brought it, and I thank you for that and staying for late on a Thursday to do so. Senator, Senator closing comments. Uh, just happy to be here in education policy, Mr. Chair. I haven't had a chance to visit you in your committee yet. Thank you. <laughs> I can move that it goes to Ed Finance. Okay, it goes to Ed Finance. Um, motion's been made to move the bill to Ed Finance. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. So Senator Gustafson, when you're ready. <clears throat> Senator, whenever you're ready. Hello, Chair Swadzinski, members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to be here tonight and the opportunity to present SF 1473. So at a time when Minnesota faces the looming shadow of a growing teacher shortage, this bill works to remove several unnecessary barriers to our current teacher licensure system. The changes will include allowing relevant experience to replace the need for a BA, allowing for our out-of-state teachers to apply for the licensure tier their experience should allow, and removing expensive and burdensome testing requirements when candidates have already shown they possess the required skills. Though allowing some individuals to teach without a, a, having obtained a BA may sound like tossing out important safeguard, the truth is it was a common and successful practice not that long ago. Prior to tiered licensure, a school could obtain a quote, non-licensed community expert uh, permission, which allowed them to hire a field expert to teach specialized classes, such as dance, woodworking, or a world language. Uh, this permission was sunset on June 30th, 2018. Fun fact, my first uh, job as a public school teacher was at Minneapolis uh, North Campus at North High School. And I was hired as a community expert because I had the experience to teach radio. So I taught radio at North in Minneapolis because there were very few people who could do that. So I am one of these people. I, of course, went on to get my teaching license, but I did have that variance of a community expert license temporarily. Some of these specialty teachers are able to shift to tier one licensure, but without uh, any without a bachelor's degree were removed from the classroom. So depriving our schools and our students of an important pool of knowledge. Um, SF 1473 will reinstate that ability while requiring safeguards, such as a person being a native speaker of the language or having a minimum of five years experience in the field they were teaching, which was my experience. Uh, Minnesota is also falling behind when it comes to recruiting qualified teachers from out of state. Any teaching candidate that wants to come here must take on the time and expense of an intensive exam they know they don't need, making it far less likely that they'll pursue, that they will 
pursue positions in Minnesota. SF-1473 removes this barrier by allowing out-of-state teachers to utilize their out-of-state licensure exams. Additionally, this bill would allow an out-of-state teacher with three or more years of teaching experience to move directly to a Tier 4 licensure. This is a crucial point as our state competes with others in a tight labor market. Um, any teacher can attest that we love good assessments of learning and loathe terrible ones, and Minnesota's current high-stakes licensure exams are quite simply bad assessments. They cost teaching candidates significant time and money to prove what the successful completion of their approved teacher preparation program already did. Uh, namely, they are competitive teachers who know that their subject matter and pedagogy. Teachers see the tests for what they are. They're more nickel and diming them for a position that they're already underpaid for. And frankly, the tests are, can be insulting, a little infuriating, a very good reason for qualified Minnesota teachers to look beyond our state's borders as a way of teaching. I know that to get my licensure to become a high school social studies teacher, I had to take three or four math tests, and they're about $150 a piece. So it is a lot. I am also pleased to say that SF-1473 also helps our districts with their severe substitute shortages. The bill creates a short call substitute teacher pilot program. It allows paras or ESPs to serve as subs short term, um, as well as individuals with an associate's degree. So, as a teacher, I am all for holding up my profession to rigorous professional standards, and I'm happy to say that in Minnesota, we do that better than most states do. Uh, but the requirements SF 1473 removes are neither rigorous nor professional, they're just simply burdensome. So their intention was right, they do nothing to hold up the standard of teaching while uh, significantly keeping teachers from advancing their careers and our districts from being able to fill the many vacancies. To go back to school and get my teaching license, I will be probably in debt until the day I die. So it is a lot and we shouldn't be um, making it harder to become a teacher, especially during the shortage. That will probably just get worse. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Do you have an amendment? No, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> the A1. The A1, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> I'm really excited about it. <laughs> Senator May Quaid, do you move the A1 amendment? All those in favor of the author's amendment, say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion carries. Mr. Chair, I'm ready to move forward with my testifiers whenever you're ready. We're ready. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Laura Mogelson. I'm the legislative liaison for the Minnesota Association of Colleges of Teacher Education. We are in support of Senate File 1473 to remove the barrier to licensure, specifically the licensure exams that were just explained here, uh, for individuals who've completed a board-approved teacher preparation program. In Minnesota, PELSBY approved programs must show evidence that teacher candidates have met standards for the content they're teaching and the general pedagogy standards for new teachers, as well as meeting statutory requirements. This is done through coursework or instructional modules and experiences in schools, which include formal observations of teaching by school and program personnel. A person cannot be recommended for a license until they have successfully completed program requirements and demonstrated effective teaching practices. These tests that people have to take are disproportionately not passed by non-native English speakers, many of whom are people of color. This is due more to the way the language is used in multiple choice tests than to any lack of knowledge or teaching skill. These multilingual teachers are being kept in, from classrooms, often bilingual or immersion classrooms, where their cultural knowledge and bilingualism are needed to help students succeed. Minnesota currently requires the licensure exams due to the erroneous belief that these exams somehow weed out bad teachers, a belief that seems logical, but it's not supported by research. My colleagues and I are happy to get you this research. The modification would move approximately 1,000 teachers who have met standards through their teacher prep programs immediately to a tier three license, so we strongly urge you to support Senate File 1473. Thank you for your time. Mr. Chair, members, my name is Mr. Chair, members, my name is Paul Spies. I'm the Legislative Action Team Lead for the Coalition Increased Teachers of Color, 
and American Indian teachers in Minnesota. I'd like to talk about the negative and disparate impact of Minnesota teacher licensing exams and our efforts to diversify the workforce in Minnesota. You might have seen an op-ed this last weekend uh, in the Star Tribune. Teacher knowledge is important, but the knowledge and skills needed for effective teaching are varied and complex, and research has clearly shown that teacher licensure exams do not measure this knowledge in a way that helps us know who will succeed as a teacher and who will not. I want to share some data from the MTLE technical report of 2020-2021 which shows that there were 3,633 teachers who did not pass all the exams, teacher candidates who did not pass the exams, two-thirds of whom were white. This is not about lowering the bar for teachers of color. This is about removing a bar that is keeping many effective teachers out of the profession or stuck on tier two, as we just heard, in passionate testimony, stuck on tier two without getting to tier three because of these exams. And this is the biggest barrier in our state other than financial barriers. So you can see on this slide the disparate impact of these exams on BIPOC communities though, with higher rates of, of BIPOC teacher candidates not passing these exams. The majority are passing them, but these higher percentages show the disparate impact of these exams, which is a true definition of systemic racism. So these exams are not valid predictors of teaching effectiveness. They're not accurate in terms of measuring all that teachers know, need to know, and can do. They have proven to, uh, they have not proven to increase student achievement. We have one of the major barriers that we said that is keeping thousands of teachers out of the profession or stuck on tier two, the financial time and emotional costs to teacher candidates. And although a majority of BIPOC teachers can pass them, again, they disproportionately negatively affect BIPOC teacher candidates. So I urge you to support this bill for those reasons. Thank you. We have another hybrid speaker. Yeah. Stephen Onowski? No? Okay. Kate, Caitlin Snyder? Oh, thank you. Thank and you, the Mr. Chair. Um, the next two speakers are Jim Grappwell and Matt Shaver, so you guys could be prepared. And um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Caitlin Snyder, and I'm speaking to you today on behalf of the 86,000 members of Education Minnesota across the state. Education Minnesota proudly supports Senate File 1473, removing barriers to education. In particular, we are excited about removing racially biased testing requirements and allowing our artists and world language teachers an easier path to the classroom, in particular, a path to the Tier 3 licensure and continuing contract status. Um, on introduction, there we had some concerns with Section 12, which deals with the short call substitute pilot. Um, and we are happy to see the amendment adopted that addresses our concerns. To be clear, the sub shortage hurts our members. Our members postpone medical appointments, give up much needed prep time to cover for colleagues, and attend work when they are sick because of the lack of available subs. However, the problem with filling these positions comes from low compensation, the working conditions in schools, and the challenges of managing a classroom of 30 or more students. Um, the bill as written d did not address the larger issue, although I know the committee is working on many of these issues, and in particular, Senator Gustafson. Um, the bill as amended addresses these concerns by incorporating protections for paraprofessionals who do not want to sub. That was part of our concern was retaliation um, against people being told to pursue this license, a daily pay rate of $200 to make it competitive, and a time period of two years. I am happy to support this bill, and I'm available for questions. Mr. Chair, members, Jim Grathwell, St. Paul Schools, again, with authors like Senator Gustafson, you don't need witnesses like me. This bill allows you to do good, avoid evil. I suggest you to support it, Senator. Thank you for your authorship. 
thank you for your uh, attention, and let's go home. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Tough act to follow. Uh, Chair Swinsinski, members of the committee, good evening again. Matt Shaver, Policy Director at Ed Allies. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of Senate File 1473 as amended. Ed Allies strongly supports a BA exemption for visual and performing arts as well as world languages and culture. This opens up a pathway for diverse and non-traditional educators to share their rich experiences and unique expertise with Minnesota students. This change will increase the relevance and rigor of learning opportunities for all kids. We also support the Substitute Teacher Pilot Program in Section 12. This is a long overdue effort to address the horrendous sub shortage that is having a deleterious effect effect on students losing out on meaningful learning experiences and stretching already stretched educators beyond capacity. Not having a wide enough sub pool continues to take prep time away from educators and administrators to cover classes, which causes people to be moved away from their primary responsibilities and duties. Um, doing something, frankly anything, and including pay for substitute teachers uh, in the bill uh, is something at least the bare minimum of what we can do to begin addressing this. Uh, this is really something that should not need to wait another school year. The consequences are too severe. Thank you, Senator Gustafson, for authoring the bill and hearing the feedback today. And thank you all for your public service to our state. Questions, comments, members? Senator Abler. So I'm just trying to sort through this. Um, we just had the other bill there. Is uh, I'm just trying to figure out what this does to Tier 2 on this one. Is it, does this do anything to make it more difficult to get a Tier 2 or anything? I appreciate the test business. I'm not even going to argue about that part. I you think you persuaded me on that point. But um, just is that a fair question to ask? I mean, so maybe uh, Dr. Bailey or whoever. Mr. Chair, Senator Abler, excellent question. So this does impact about 835 Tier 2 teachers, about 30% of whom are teachers of color. It would immediately move them up to a Tier 3 license. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and, but there's, and so it, it's, it's moving things kind of in the opposite direction of the last bill, but it's, I'm not trying to go back to that bill. Um, but, it, it, but I appreciate that. And so uh, it's removing some barriers. Um, and I just was trying to it strikes the... Um, it's just it, it, that um, somebody who aren't allowed to do something without a bachelor's degree, but that's um, is that's just irrelevant to what I'm trying to ask you, trying to figure out where that section was. Section six. Yeah, section six. Does that make it more difficult? Yeah, um, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Abler. So sections two, five, and six through eight include that BA exemption across all tiers. So it actually makes it so folks who are currently kept out of having a license altogether, as our bill author explained in some of her own experience, um, would be able to then get their tiered license and move up the tiers. All right, well, so this is, so I, 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 it's late and I'm not trying to query you too deeply, but it, I, thank you for making it easier for good people to teach. And I, I'm not one for low standards, but I'm just given the previous testimony of many people who have talked to me in my whole lengthy career, um, you know, it's, uh, it, we just need people who are dedicated, who are willing to stick through it, uh, who know, who are competent, and I'm all for that, so I'll stop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Gustafson, great bill. Thanks for bringing it forward. I appreciate it. I'm just going to say a couple things about it, if that's okay. Um, the exemptions for the bachelor's degree at the respective tiers, I think that's great. Eliminates barriers, like Senator Abler said, allows them to move forward. A couple of questions uh, I would have, I'll just leave them rhetorically for now. On page four, sub, uh, subdivision 2A, specific to the tier two licensures, it talks about um, some exemptions for having a bachelor's degree, having an associate's degree, professional certification, five years of relevant work experience. And then when I compare that to what's currently in place, um, some of the things that would be stricken in, in the other bill, um, have to do with um, completing field-specific methods of training, two years of teaching experience, receiving passing scores, et cetera. What I would like to see us do, if we're, if we're looking at these bills holistically, is provide the maximum amount of exemptions that are either in this bill or have existed in the past as well to sort of maximize the abilities and pathways for folks to obtain that license and, and move on. Um, and then this really has not much to do with your bill in particular because I don't necessarily disagree with it being in here. And it has to do with the conversation we had earlier about 
standards and the fact that we were this was all about standards, this, that, and the other. On page seven, uh, line 7.10 under subdivision one, which is tests, some language is stricken. And the language stricken talks about a candidate having to demonstrate a passing score on a board adopted examination of skills in reading, writing, and mathematics. And you already talked about some of these tests and your experience with them. I would certainly say your experience is much more valid as I have not had the experience with that. When I look at, on the same page, lines uh, 7.25 through 7.27, I do get a little bit more concerned because we're striking language that says this. Candidates for an initial Tier 3 and Tier 4 license, now mind you, we're not applying this to Tier 1 and Tier 2, but it's Tier 3 and Tier 4 licenses to teach elementary students must pass test items assessing the candidate's knowledge, skill, and ability in comprehensive scientifically based reading instruction. Knowledge and understanding of the foundations of reading development, development of reading comprehension, and reading assessment and instruction, and the ability to integrate that knowledge and understanding into instruction strategies. That's language that we're striking from existing law. That to me seems to be counter to the very argument that we had earlier about how important standards are for teachers in the classroom at specific tier levels. Now we're gonna go ahead and give that exemption for tier levels three and four in this case, and they seem to get treated fairly well as they should, they're great teachers. Uh, but that's just something that I'd like us to consider as we're having these conversations, and at the end of the day, if I can just say it simply, just trying to maximize all the ways people be can become great quality licensed teachers in Minnesota, respective of their tier levels, and progress and increase their certifications if they need to, be of great quality, but really solve the issue, which is the shortage right now. So again, that is not meant to be a criticism of your bill. I'm hoping that we can find consistency in pathways, creating more teachers, keeping great teachers, retaining them. So um, I'll leave it at that. I know we're short on time. It's a great bill. I do appreciate Pelsby. I'm not trying to uh, throw shade your way all day today. Uh, I appreciate the, the fact that you have the short call substitute stuff in here. That's important. Um, uh, Education Minnesota, I appreciate you working with the author of this bill to make sure that we address that a version of that past 65 and 0 in the Senate last year. So I'm hopeful that it will become law and will help districts, classrooms, teachers, and kids across the state. So thank you. I, to, thank you to Senator, if it's okay, Mr. Chair, to say something. And, and thank you to Senator Duckworth. I agree with you. Um, I will say that for the, and, and I'm gonna let my testifier speak more about this, but first I'm gonna tell three really long stories. Um, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to say that um, some of the tests are um, I, that I, I just, re because I got my teaching license like, I don't know, 11, 12 years ago, something like that. And, and some of them are just remedial and they're sort of like after you've taken all of the training and, on teaching and you kind of come in, there's other safeguards, I guess is what I'm saying. So, um, but I, your concern is valid, and that's where I think I'll let my testifier spe uh, be specific about that. It's just, I think if you have gotten your teaching license in the last, like, few, I don't know, decade or so, there are so many obstacles, and we do have a really stringent process for teaching. It almost makes it, it, it makes it difficult to stick with it. I can't tell you how many people I started my cohort with to get a teaching license, half of them dropped out. It just became too cumbersome. It took too long and it cost too much money. Um, so, but you're, I, I mean, I hear, I, when you see it like that, I, I can, I definitely see your concerns too. But if you want to talk about the tiers. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'll take 30 seconds to say, for the reading piece in particular, um, there isn't a particular, there isn't a reading exam. There are some embedded things for science of reading in a few, in the elementary exam. That's had an 88% pass rate for the past 10 years, and as you know, that does not correlate to our literacy gap because it's still an issue. Um, so what we're doing to address that, the test isn't the, isn't the solve. The solve is we're currently auditing now with all of our teacher preparation writers specific to the science of reading and working with them to revamp the programs on the prep side. And then now, as you have several bills coming before you from the Department of Education and the House Rep Edelson on dealing with teachers who are already licensed on getting them the training. So we are very supportive of both of those aspects. Senator May Quaid. Uh, thank you, Mr. Senator Chair. Duckworth, were you done? I'm sorry. Just thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Duckworth, I did want to just say that the Literacy Act bill that we talked about, the READ Act, that is part of what this is about. It's that higher ed piece and that 
K E12 piece too. So that will be taken care of. Closing comments. Um, no, I just thank you. I, I wasn't here earlier. I was actually testifying in another committee. So um, it sounds like it was a long night for everybody. I just appreciate all of the people who are putting attention into uh, just education in general. It's a complicated uh, topic sometimes. So I think it's good that we're tackling it. So you'll come back for those three long stories oh. another time. <laughs> Catch me later. Yeah. Do you want to move your? I'll move it. Okay, thank you, Senator. <laughs> I know. I'll move that uh, Senator Gustafson's bill 1473 is laid over for possible inclusion. Mm -hmm. No, it's going. I would like to refer it to Ed Finance. Right. Right. Money. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion carries. Buckle up. I have the gavel now. Senator Swazinski moves his bill, Senate File 1641, before the committee. Senator Swazinski, go ahead. I do have the A1 author's amendment. Uh, Senator Swazinski uh, moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Swazinski, Senate File 1641 is amended. Okay. Well, thank you, members and those in the audience that are still here. Uh, I told you we'd be out here at 7.30. I'm a little bit behind schedule, so thank you for, for, um, for being here tonight and um, so we can do, as Senator Abler said, the people's business. So um, my bill last is fairly easy, I hope. It's just to clarify language and definitions and technical things. So um, I'm going to turn it, rest it over to the testifier. Um, Chair, members of the committee, my name is Michelle Hirschfott and I'm with Pelsby. Um, again, all of these items are technical in nature, but for the membership piece, I will highlight that um, the um, bill would add two new... Can you, I'm sorry, excuse me, can you just point us to a, um, either in the amendment or in the bill where you're at? Um, yes. Um, beginning on page three, line eight, you'll see... Um, proposed changes to the statute around our board membership, um, including changes to eligibility. This bill would add two teacher members to the board um, and add pieces around compensation, and we consider that the one policy component of the bill. The rest of this is um, technical pieces that we hope will um, make data and reporting pieces easier um, and really clarify processes and terminology. Thank you. Um, is Dr. Yelena Bailey, are you testifying on this as well? No, I just have you written down. You do not have to testify. <clears throat> can... Thanks for gracing us with your presence. Caitlin Snyder, would you like to testify on this bill? Madam Chair and the committee, uh, my name is Caitlin Snyder representing Education Minnesota and our very many members across the state. I would like to speak to you today in support of the amendment to Senate File 1641 and I am going to give a little bit of a history lesson because uh, I'm a sadist. So for folks that were elected after 2017, you may not know that the bill establishing Pelsby um, was vetoed twice before it was signed into law. And there were three outstanding issues at the end of the day, one of which was the compensation of the Board of Pelsby. Governor Dayton and the legislature had a disagreement. The governor believed that the board should be made up of a majority board members, and the legislature chose to move forward with a bill that created a board with five classroom teachers and six other members, and five is smaller than six. Um, today, due to open positions, we have two classroom teachers serving on Pelsby. This is not an accident. This is how the board was designed to function with more non-teacher voices on it. I want to be clear that this board makeup is an aberration. There is no other board in state statute that I could find was like this. A couple of examples, the Board of School Administrators has 10 members, seven of whom are school administrators. The Board of Nursing has 16 members, 12 of whom are nurses. Um, Pelsby needs more teacher members, not just because I think it's the great idea, but because um, of the practical purposes of doing their job. 
Only teachers can serve on the discipline committee. With only two teachers currently on the board, deadlock decisions can be commonplace. Or if one of the teacher members knows the teacher under review, they need to recuse themselves, leaving one person in the state responsible for all of the dis discipline decisions coming through the board. These board openings can be hard to fill, both for teachers and administrators, which is why I thank the committee for adopting language that would allow um, time off to join board meetings and providing board members with a stipend. As a labor union, we believe in paying people for their work. I also believe it is a good idea to keep the categories of teachers as broad as possible, um, in this case, metro and rural, to keep the applicant pool large. One of the current non-classroom teacher board members is a teacher prep member. And this is not the same thing as a classroom teacher working with students every day, but it is a vital part of Pelsby's work. Part of their work is reviewing all of the teacher prep programs and all of the different programs um, at these teacher prep programs. And this is an incredible lift for the one person who has training in teacher prep right now. So adding another teacher prep member to the board is also vital to make the board function appropriately. This amendment brings the board to 13 members in total, seven classroom teachers, two members of teacher prep, three administrators, and one member of the public. This much more closely resembles the boards, um, but more importantly, will provide the board with the membership they need to execute their work for educators and students in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Any questions for Ms. Snyder? Okay, Mr. Shaver. Please introduce yourself for the committee and you may begin your testimony. Good evening, Chair May Quaid, members of the committee. I uh, continue to be Matt Shaver uh, and still employed as policy director at, at Allies. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on Senate File 1641 as amended. Uh, a couple pieces of feedback and then uh, one, one definitely big area that we support uh, would be paying board members. As somebody whose job it is when it's not the session to watch Pelsby board hearings, I, I can't tell you how much work folks who put in on the board and, and how much turnover there's been. And I think paying people for their work makes a ton of sense. And it's a huge, important responsibility to be a Pelsby board member. Um, and as the legislature considers uh, adding additional teacher voice to the composition of the board, we'd encourage the explicit inclusion of tier one and tier two teachers so their unique and valuable insights can contribute to the important work of the board. Um, and then lines 2.8 through 2.18 propose a needed clear definition of shortages of teachers of color and indigenous teachers. We support this clarification. Um, however, we feel that uh, only changing this component of the teacher shortage definition miss misses an opportunity to improve our state's understanding of the very real shortages facing our students. We, we find it problematic that nobody in this room can tell us how many unfilled teaching positions we have in Minnesota right now. Um, a, a bill to include that as part of our teacher shortage definition passed the Senate last year unanimously. Um, we'd love to see that happen again so we can begin addressing these unfilled positions that we've heard about um, all session. I was in, in the back, Chair, Chair Swodzinski, and you have eight licensed teacher openings in Eden Prairie right now. Um, would like to know what licenses are, are experiencing the biggest shortages, where are they located, all of those things. Um, I don't think we're gonna start actually measuring that until we make it a requirement to do so. Um, so I want to thank Senator Swadzinski for authoring the bill, hearing our feedback today. Thank you to the members of the committee for your public service to our state. Thank you for your testimony. Members, questions for Senator Swadzinski? We'll go to Duckworth and Abler. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a few things to run through briefly. Um, first, on uh, page one, lines 1.15 to 1.17, <clears throat> states a teacher must hold a license or a permission aligned to the content area and scope of the teacher's assignment to provide instruction in a public school or charter school. Um, I, I guess maybe I would have made the assumption that was the case already, but it must not be if we're adding it to the law. So I, my broader question is, does this, does this mean a math teacher can't teach econ and an English teacher can't teach history? Let's say someone's in a pinch and a teacher's going to cover down for them for the day. Is that something that we're not going to allow with this bill? Dr. Bailey. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, so currently that's the case already. Um, you can apply for an auto field permission to do that or get a substitute to do that, um, but you can't just put them in without the process. This part of the cleanup here is when you created Pelsby, some of what was in statutes under MDE wasn't clarified or put into Pelsby statutes and vice versa. So again, this is technical to basically codify what is already the case and what has historically been um, under MDE's kind of jurisdiction, if that makes sense, when they held the Department of Licensing, which is now part of Pelsby. Mm -hmm. So this is just technically putting this language in our statute of a practice that is already true. 
Senator okay. Duckworth. I will take you at your word. I appreciate that. On the next page, page two, I'm just going to echo the sentiments of Mr. Schaefer as a as a regard to shortage area. Uh, we need to come up with, and you guys have heard me talk about this before. We did pass a bill for it last year. We have got to come up with a way that accurately shows us across the state what our true shortage areas are, regardless of tier, um, licensure status, uh, and regardless of maybe other um, demographics. If someone's in the classroom teaching, they should be counted. There could be an asterisk there that says they're maybe of a certain tier and we'd like to be in, we'd like to see them progress, but it does not give us an accurate picture in terms of the true shortages that we're seeing across the state. And I would really like to see some improvement or movement there, and I do appreciate there being at least some attention given to it. On page seven, again, we've talked about standards a little bit this evening. And line point seven six talks about publicly reported summary data on teacher preparation providers must include, and then we're striking a bunch of stuff. Number one, we're striking student entrance requirements for each professional education, educator licensing and standards board approved program, including grade point average for enrolling students in the preceding year. On line 7.11, we're striking the average board adopted skills examination or ACT or SAT scores of students entering the program in the preceding year. And on line 7.16, we're striking the average time resident and non-resident program graduates in the preceding year need to complete the program. Um, to me, that that seems like, I don't know why we would be removing it. It seems like useful data that could be utilized over time. So the fact that we're going to get rid of it or not have some transparency regarding that information seems odd to me when we're trying to improve standards and quality, as has been talked about earlier today. On page 11, um, it talks about, I'm going to go to line one. 11.15 under licensure via portfolio it says the professional educator licensing and standards board must adopt rules establishing a process for an eligible applicant to obtain it used to say any teacher license now it just says an initial tier three license uh, so and maybe i'm reading this incorrectly it seems to be eliminating a potential avenue for teachers of a different tier level uh, to progress or to utilize this. And I just would be wondering why we're doing that. Um, and then there are some other instances in which, well, I'm going to skip that for now because we're kind of late. I'm going to go to page 18. And this one really, when we, when we talk about the standards and quality question, has me scratching my head. Line 18.6. This is the, the language that is stricken from current law. The rules adopted by the Professional Educator Licensing and Standards Board for renewing a Tier 3 or a Tier 4, again, we really love our Tier 3 and Tier 4 folks, uh, under Sections 122A.183 and 122A.184, respectively, must include showing satisfactory evidence of successful teaching or administrative experience for at least one school year during the period covered by the license and grades or subjects for which the license is valid for completing such additional preparation as required under this section. That seems like we're removing or eliminating language that kind of gets at standards and quality. Now again, I'm under the, the assumption that a vast majority of our teachers are amazing, they do great things, that's awesome. But if we're going to dig our heels in on the, the standards and quality issue when it relates to other bills, then I, I think having that be consistent throughout other pieces of legislation is important. Um, I know that I seem critical of this bill, but those are just some things I want to get feedback on. There are other things in here that are good, and uh, I appreciate the attempt and the effort to try to solve this problem, to, great, to get good people in the classroom, and to help the shortage that we're experiencing. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Duckworth. Michelle, Dr. Bailey, Senator Swazinski, would you like to answer some of those questions? Yes, um, Chair, members of the committee. Um, the reason that the this bill would strike that language is that there are a number of reasons that a teacher... Michelle, could you reference what specific language? Yes, I am looking at... Thank you so much. I'm looking at lines 18.6 um, through 18.12, um, where language strikes that someone would not have to show evidence of teaching one school year aligned to the grade levels or subjects taught. Um, and the reason this is struck is that many of our licensed teachers hold multiple licenses um, and or take leaves of absence. And so we do not want to say that because you are taking a leave of absence for X amount of time or you did not teach for one year in one of your license areas that you can't renew that license. And so this is really meant to streamline 
um, the renewal process and ensure that folks who are maintaining the renewal requirements are able to renew that tier three or tier four license on an ongoing basis without creating, again, additional barriers to maintaining licensure. Um, Dr. Bailey or Sarah Swazinski, did you want to respond to the, uh, any of the other pieces? Dr. Bailey? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, quickly to the uh, data points for teacher preparation. Again, this language is keeping up with what changes have been brought forth. So one of the things that the legislature has done, which has been very powerful, is to advocate for alternative providers. And so the data we collect now is being streamlined so that it is equitable across different provider types. So GPA, ACT, that's, those aren't requirements for alternative providers. So there are other data points that are more tied to outcomes based on research that we are collecting, but those become irrelevant when we treat our providers based off the standards that we have rather than seeing it as traditional preparation only. Senator Duckworth, did you have anything else? Nope, I appreciate the information. Thank you. And Senator Abler, I'm going to come to you really quick, but I do have a question about 7.15. Um, it says their summary data on teacher educator qualifications and their years of experience either as birth through grade 12 classroom teachers or school administrators. I just want to know why you say more about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, members of the committee. So we do have licenses that include early educators, and so it's just to make sure we're including the wide scope of those. And again, this language uses the new teacher educator versus faculty because we're trying to be inclusive of all of our providers here. That makes sense. Thank you. Senator Abler. Well, thanks. And I would have asked Senator Sudzinski, but he doesn't really do math. So I'm going to ask Dr. Bailey. Is that kindness? Yeah. Um, anyway, so I was just trying to follow the... Uh, the changes in this, just the, the, array, the array of the members of, uh, of the board. And I just was, I was reading that there was 11 and six were teachers, which is the majority. Senator Abler, can you just point us to the line? Oh, yeah, page, uh, page three, it's this section starting on 3.8 and going the rest of the page. Please continue. Um, anyway, so, I, so I, it sounds like there was already a majority, which and I just, this confused me. And so I now, could you just tell me? Who makes up the board now? Like, there's sounds like there's gonna be seven teachers who are teaching. Just could you go the list of? There's gonna be an amendment, and I'm sorry, I'm confused. So just that's it's not a hard. I'm not trying to. It's not meant to be tricky. Michelle. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, so I am looking at lines 3.24 and going down. So the five current teacher members include a teacher from our charter school, a teacher from outside of the seven. Um, county Metro, a teacher from inside the Metro, one related services provider, so for example, a school speech language pathologist, and then one special education teacher. Um, you'll see at that next line, it does refer, um, so the current language in law indicates one teacher from a teacher preparation program. That's a teacher educator who's not a current classroom teacher. So when we reference five classroom teachers, we're really talking about the five oh. members that preceded that number. Um, then the number, the folks. But that would be really the six Abler. teachers, right? So I got it. So five classroom teachers, one teacher educator. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so then who, who's Abler. the rest? I'm sorry. That's okay. Madam Chair. Senator Avery. So and uh, so who are the rest of five then? Michelle. Madam Chair, Senator <laughs> Abler, committee members. Um, the remaining um, board members include one superintendent. Um, one school, so this is what in current law, one um, HR member, um, one administrator who oversees a special education cooperative, one principal, um, and then one member of the public is five, plus our five classroom teachers are one teacher educator gets to, to 11, and I'm also not great at math, which is terrifying. But then who's Senator new? Abler. Oh, Madam Chair. Senator Abler. <laughs> Senator Swazinski, if you're paying attention, you could answer this question. So who are the other two people that are going to be new? Because they're going to 13. Senator Swazinski or Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, the two, they've added, we've added two new teachers. So now there's not just one teacher high school, or one teacher, it's a greater Minnesota. Or one, <laughs> yeah, it used to be one teacher in a charter school and one teacher from a school located in the seven county metro area and they bumped those two ones to two. So that's the two additional. All right, so. And that's Sen in the amendment. Senator. Right, no, and I, but just somebody then, somebody mentioned tier one and tier two. So there's not a tier one and tier two teacher on here necessarily. I just, somebody mentioned that and that's why I was so confused. Senator Lurie, I think that was mentioned as a suggestion. Ah, a suggestion. 
Uh, thank you. I appreciate the math. Thank you. I'm, I'm completed my questions. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Senator, appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Okay. Uh, with that, Senator Swazinski, Senator Swazinski makes a new motion that Senate File 1641 uh, be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Would you I like make a closing? Senator Susanski, my apologies. Please close your bell. Um, while you're packing up, I just want to thank everybody one more time for being here tonight. You know, we've got um, shortages in three, many professions, but three, in my opinion, that are critical, um, nurses, police officers, and um, teachers. And we are all struggling with how do we keep that respect and admiration that those three professions have and make the standards not easier, but not as difficult, if that even is making any sense at what 815. And there, that's the great difficulty I think we're all facing right now, is how do we fill those three such noble, respectable professions without lowering the bar and the standards that we feel are so important for those professions. And I think tonight was a little microcosm of a debate we as a society really truly need to have um, across the board. So um, anyways, thank you again for the late night, everybody. Thank you. Would you like me to adjourn? Thanks. The committee is adjourned.